Hey, I'm Nerd and Geek Brethren. It's me, C.K. Helms, and I'm the host of the Good Stuff Podcast, which comes out every Thursday. You might know me from the hit web series Gotham Knights, where I play the Red Hood. Stay out of my way, Green. What about me, C.K.? Am I not important? Yes, Gary, you're important too, but as I told you, you're like a sidekick, not a co-host. But anyways, if you like all nerd and geek-like stuff, then you're going to like the Good Stuff Podcast. We also talk to local entertainment people. If you want to be on the Good Stuff Podcast, then email us, goodstuffpodcastyahoo.com. Like the Facebook page and listen to us on iTunes and Podbean. Thanks, guys. We'll see you every Thursday. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. As usual, I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. I'm Craig Lance. I'm Sean. Hey, and I'm Jerry. How's it going, everybody? I hate him. <laughs> started already. <laughs> no. God. No, no, that's Dan. No, no, we're here. You're sounding like a douchebag. We're just, we're just face. Place. See, I try to sound energetic and happy coming in because it's, well, it's the week before Christmas, guys. Are we excited? Hell yeah. Awesome. You guys got big plans? Anything going on? Hell no. Cool. Well, you know, got <laughs> all the family. I guess it really depends on how you start your week. Do you start it on Sunday or do you start it on Monday? Sunday. Okay, so it's the week of Christmas. It is the week of Christmas. It is. I'm having a Christmas dinner tonight, mm-hmm. and then we're going to the in laws. Lots of stuff's happening. But so people don't know this, but we just did our our uh, Southern Fried Geekery Secret Santa right before the show, mm-hmm. and we got some awesome stuff. My Secret Santa came from one Mister Craig Lance. And it is an amazing He-Man action figure that I believe is a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive. It was. You know? That's freaking rad. He's making his what's going on face from that one YouTube video. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Prince Adam. At, before, yeah. From pink, the, pink shirt, bowl cut, gay yeah. as fuck. Just like, <laughs> the super fabulous. Love Because fabulous powers were granted to him when he holds aloft his magic sword. Exactly. <laughs> a good a good aloft sword makes the world a difference. <laughs> and, and following in the He-Man theme, <laughs> I got a He-Man action figure of Michael Myers. Nice. Nice. Funko figures, along with the uh, Dungeonology Dungeons and Dragons book, which is really amazing. That's yeah. badass. Oh, it's got a mind flare on the cover. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty awesome. And and I think it's uh, a lot of it's Forgotten Realms. Yeah, look at the spine. Yeah. It's all the Forgotten Realms stuff, so it goes over like a lot of the characters and locations the that they deeps. touch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those deep cuts. It's very cool. And going as far away from He-Man as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb got me a very nice series and movie uh, collab of uh, Gotcha Man, which some of you might know as G-Force, or even go back to the 70s in the U.S. release of Battle for the Planets. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's some old school anime goodness I can't wait to dive into. I animate hard, y'all. He did. And he animated. <laughs> that, that's even more impressive. That's the that's a true gift I got for Christmas. <laughs> that Caleb animated. Making, making Caleb he bought anime. anime. Speaking of <laughs> anime, Sean actually got me a t-shirt of my favorite character from My Hero Academia, and Tokoyami. Then- very it. cool. It's amazing. And then, Badass. So tell people who don't know what a Tokoyama, like me before five minutes ago, um, what so, is a Tokoyami? So we talked about My Hero Academia and people were born with quirks. Uh, Tokoyami is a person that was born with like a bird head, but he has this this quirk that he calls Dark Shadow. And it's almost like um, a separate entity that is built into his shadow that he can control and manipulate. And the darker it is outside, the stronger it gets, but the harder it gets to control. It's a pretty awesome power. I'm... I love the character. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's this. that's dope. Yeah. And, well, so oh, and I'm sorry. Stephanie got us all uh, comic book uh, frames. It's yeah. So uh, in this, we should. I think we have to clarify because two of the SFG yes. guys have Stephanie's as, <laughs> as better halves. Stephanie Straw. Yeah, yes. Stephanie Straw, the the one and only, the amazing. Uh, how does she put up with Jerry? Like, do you think she mm-hmm. has a big comic case at home that she squishes Jerry between and hangs him on the wall? That's what I want. She now has her own Jerry to hang up on the wall. Eventually. Yes, because Stephanie and I. No, just Stephanie. Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> received from Sean a beat art of us. And I think it's actually, is it my profile It's your profile right? Yeah, picture. it's my profile picture right now. And it was us, I think, at Tanya's At Tanya's wedding? Yeah. It's, it's deep circle connection yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we're going to have to post pictures of all that stuff that we got. For sure. We are. Yeah, we'll stick them on the Instagram. All right, so before we get too far ahead, we had something else really cool happen. Not to us this week, but to a very dear friend of ours. Our buddy Dalton Shannon got married this week. He, he took the big plunge. Uh, he and his lady friend Alexis have been together for, I'm not sure how long, they've been together for a hot minute. 
Yeah. Uh, and they, they tied the knot this week, and it was awesome. They had asked me to officiate, and I did. Uh, it took place up in northwest Arkansas. And nothing matters. And nothing <laughs> was, So I love my boy Dalton, right? Y'all know I do. I've never heard anyone do nihilistic wedding vows but him, and it it, it kind of worked. <laughs> we, we Grant, were, Grant Morrison wrote his wedding vows. <laughs> it was great. No, it was it was super, it, they were the most Dalton wedding vows possible. I, I now um, need him to cosplay the nihilist from Big Lebowski. Oh. <laughs> right. No. But so Dalton also runs his own uh, indie comic publishing group. It's called Four Color Media. Um, they have their own Twitter page, their website. He and his comic making partner have, uh, they're doing some really cool stuff. But one of the reasons, and we're actually going on either Facebook Live or just doing it as a video right now. Dalton and Alexis got me a gift for hosting or officiating their wedding. I haven't looked at it yet. So we're going to see what it is just real quick because he asked me to do it on the show. Oh. And I'm nothing if not gracious. So Prep for the glitter bomb. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and the fart spray. Holy shit. Oh. Oh, my God. Like, I'm not, like, it's fucking Journey into Mystery number one. Holy it's shit. King size annual number one. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Still, holy it's shit. It's got Thor, her, uh, dude, this is gorgeous. I believe that's first appearance of Hercules. I think. Think you're right. I'm not 100 percent sure. This is a ma- dude. I lo- like Alexis. I'm coming after your dude. Um, <laughs> this is a ma- like from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. This is awesome. Like I had no idea what this was. I can't believe it. That's way too much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I'm gonna set this right in front of me so I can see it for this entire podcast. <laughs> and this is, is gonna look great in that comic frame that that. Stephanie just got me. Now, it so is now, first now appearance you know. of Hercules. It is the f- dude. And now you know what to charge people from now on if they want you to marry them. Right? Just He's first set the new standard now. I okay, mean. in this video with something special. Um, something special? All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now. Holy shit. You yeah, to, I you can't. Right now? Yeah, go ahead, dude. Throw it up there. Yeah. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, man. That's That's insane. I don't really know how to follow that, so I'm just going to quit. The show. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Um, Not even fifty-two episodes. We're just we're just ending it. Lo- love you, brother. Man, seriously, that's that's rad. Thank you, thank you both. You and Alexis both are amazing people, and uh, your wedding was beautiful. And I couldn't ask for better friends. Uh, we had a great time. Sean, buddy, Sir. you draw pictures. I do from think. time to time. I do, or from day to day. What'd you draw this week, man? Another good week of random ass requests that were fun as shit to draw. Of course. Uh, finishing off, uh, Bryant Thompson's request of us doing JoJo poses was Caleb doing his best Rohan impression in front of the Louvre. This was instead <laughs> Caleb going to, uh, lawyer school or whatever it's called. <laughs> Law school? school? No, nah, lawyer school. Lawyer school? Lawyer education. School of lawyers. <laughs> so I know what the Louvre is. What's a Johan? Uh, Rohan is from a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Okay. Uh, he'd had a, he's an artist who can, uh, open up people's faces to read their life. As weird as that does sound, but he's also a manga artist. And he had his own special one-shot story where he went to the Louvre, where, of course, weird JoJo shit happened. That's but, awesome. But that pose was literally like, you know, it was a journey to get there. But when he gets there, it's a big double-page spread, Winnie Freeman, uh, <laughs> uh, of him striking that pose, lifting his shirt, being as sexy gay as hell as he can be. <laughs> he's like, I've arrived at the Louvre. You said it was a journey to get there. Was it a journey in the mystery? No. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. not like the Like the comic I just got? Look, Hercules doesn't matter. Thor doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Those were actually Dalton's best. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's amazing. But yes, uh, that was Caleb as doing his Rohan pose because Caleb had to and he had to have the man bag. Yes, he did. That's badass. All right. After that, it was Stephanie and Jerry as a Cronenberg monster <laughs> <laughs> as requested by one Jonathan Fletcher. After that, it, Bryant Thompson again requested that he be drawn as a slime in the vein of <laughs> that time I got reincarnated as a slime that we talked about last episode. Following that, it was Caleb as Santa as requested by <laughs> Rod Hedrick. And of course, it was Caleb reminding all the good boys and girls to make sure you leave bourbon and cookies out for him. I assume bourbon. I thought to ask you your favorite drink of choice, but I didn't want to ruin it. No, nah, bourbon's bourbon's a good yeah. Bourbon, bourbon's my go-to. I feel like I thought so. <laughs> I, I, sure do, I do. I do bourbon that. as a general drink, and if I'm out at dinner, I'll have a gin martini just cause to feel fancy. Fancy sauce. Gotcha. After that, it was continuing the trend of Deadpool side hugging people. It was him hugging Hugh Jackman, begging him for one more go to get Wolverine and him in a movie together. <laughs> that was requested by our good friend Nick Helms. Following that, it was the wrestler Space Monkey, as requested by Wendy Freeman. And finally, I did the entire gang as a Red Dead Redemption posse. That was awesome. And it was great. 
I think I'm glad y'all like I didn't really hear it. It was kind of okay. It was okay. You didn't like your band up <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. <laughs> Even give you the Native American. Although, I was going to say, why did I, like, I, I got the Tomahawk because yeah. I'm, like, yes. like, one forty second something, right? Yeah. Okay. That's why. Fuck you. That's why. <laughs> and I know you people. I try to get as close as we could. I had the Derby. What do you, what do you mean, you people? I mean, you fucking nerds across the <laughs> table from me. <laughs> that's why you had the Native American thing. Jerry had the dandy dress, like, um, uh, I forget that, that, um, Marvel or DC, uh, Whiplash, wasn't it? He kind of dressed kind of fancy cowboy character. Uh, fancy Dan. From Marvel? Maybe it was Marvel. I don't remember. But I know it was like, it was in the back of my head when I was designing your look. Mm. <laughs> it was based on that. I think the name was like Batlash or Whiplash or something like that. Batlash. I that believe. Yeah, yeah, probably yeah. Batlash. But yeah. And of course I had to wear the bowler derby because that's classy as fuck. That's my, badass. It those, is. That's my drawing for the week though. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> uh, so if you want to see those and if you want to see a whole lot more and you listen to this podcast, you should jump over to Facebook, where we are Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. We have a page set up where we're always talking about news, drama, stuff that's going on, Sean's drawings, things we find interesting, um, things we don't find interesting, <laughs> uh, all kinds of stuff. We have that set up over there. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. We're at SFG Podcast on both of those. Have a great time on those sites. We talk about stuff on the show. We talk about stuff that doesn't make it to the show. Um, so come like our pages. At, you know, Join in the SFG community. It's kind of badass. It's getting bigger and better every week. And, and a lot of that is to Sean's drawings and stuff like that. And just interactions in, in general. Hell yeah. Um, so one of the things we also post on our page is news when news happens. Um, we actually, if you, if you like to hear us talk about news, we talk about a lot more news on our page than we have time to talk about in the show. So if you enjoy the kind of banter we have here at the table, come check it out. We, you know, we're, we're on there talking, we're commenting on posts, just doing the thing. So. This week we had a few that were, uh, you know, some some big things happened. Okay, the one of the biggest to me, and Craig and I were having this conversation earlier. There is a new comics publisher that just released, it, it, like they just hit the market this week. It, they had their big launch about a week ago. They're called TKO Publishing. I had no idea this was going to be a thing. I don't think Craig or any of us did either. When they hit the scene, they kind of blew up because they're doing something different. They are essentially doing a workaround to the direct market. You guys have heard us talk about the direct market on here and how we have particular opinions about it. I personally don't think the direct market is a good thing. I think it's got a stranglehold on the comics industry. TKO is doing a workaround on that. They're kind of giving a middle finger to it. They're not going through Diamond. None of their stuff is available through Diamond. It's only through their website. This isn't a small company. These dudes have some money behind them. Um, they initially launched four different books. Kind of the main one and the one that really caught my attention was a book called Sarah. It's by Garth Ennis. I forget who the main artist is at the, off the top of my head, but the color artist is Betty Brettweiser, who is, in my opinion, one of the top three colorists in the industry. Um, I've got some issues with her social media presence, but that's <laughs> beside the point. She is talented. You can't take that away from her. She's right. extremely talented. So like, Garth Ennis and one of the top three colorists, they are not fucking around. Yeah. Um, they right. also, in their next batch of four books, are dropping a Jeff Lemire book. Yeah. Like They have got big names. And you can buy these books straight from them. They're going, they're, they're doing Amazon. They're doing everything but the direct market. Or you go on tkstudios.com and you do, uh, you, you launch that. And that kind of got us into a conversation about, uh, the direct market and it, about how your local comic shops work and, and just in general, our thoughts on those. It's interesting. So I, well, one the, of the, the world's changed a lot, right? When Amazon came out a few years, what's it been about 10 years now? It's been a while now, yeah. You know, it kind of, everybody then cried, that's the end of brick and mortar. It hasn't been quite the doomsday that people thought it was going to be, but it certainly has changed. I do most of my gift shopping on Amazon. Oh, for sure. There's <laughs> comic book stores right now that are really struggling, and there's a handful of them that are struggling because they're not very good business people to begin with. They're fans, and because they're fans, they open a comic book store, and they do okay when the market's doing well, but when things slow down, if you're, if you're not a business person to try and maintain that business going... And you become friends with your customers, and then they don't come pick up their books for a little bit. And you don't want to be a dick to your friends, so you let it go a little bit longer than it should. Next thing you know, you got three months worth of back issues from ten different boxes, right? That you can't sell because people aren't going back and buying books from yeah. that close unless it's a key issue. If they wanted it, they would have bought it when it came out. So you have these these comic shops that are really struggling. And, and another side of that is services like BCBS mm -hmm. that's out there, which is a mail order comic book service. Caleb, you said they were under the, the same discount 
that they get the same discount on books at the local comic book stores. As far yeah. as I know. Now, yeah. that that's a tricky thing because one of the things we're talking about, I don't know if they get – I don't know if Diamond tiers the way they discount to comic shops. So for, for those of you who, who may not know and you're wondering how the, the, the retail mechanics work, your, your comic shop doesn't buy the comics at what the cover price is. They get a discount comics. Most of it, I think, Craig, we were both talking, I think we're both pretty sure it's they, – they buy it at a 50% discount from your big two. There's yes. a little bit of a different discount from your other ones. And then, and then you pay the price. That's how they make their profit. They can also afford to give you a discount. If you have a pull list or something, they, you know, a lot of shops do 10, 15, 20 percent discounts. Um, that they, and they can still make a profit on that. And that's how depending that's how on the their business overhead model works, right? You know, and that's the that's the key is the smaller the business, the larger your overhead is. Right. Believe it or not, because the more volume you have coming through, if you're selling wickets and you sell a million wickets, you have a lot less overhead on each wicket than if you sell a thousand wickets. He's my favorite Ewok. Right, he's the best Ewok. You know, so if if you're selling at a higher volume, your your overhead goes down exponentially, which right. allows you to discount bigger numbers for if for you're larger, selling all over the country versus right. selling in Sherwood, Arkansas. It makes a huge difference because you have a larger market to to hit from, so your overhead is less. Yeah. What I don't understand is how DCBS does it at 50% off on some of their books because either they're giving those books away. Or they're getting them at a steeper discount. Or they're getting them at a steeper discount, which to me is unfair to the local comic book stores. It, it it's may how be. capitalism works, and yeah. I understand that. But it's unfair to the local comic book stores. And it's going to, if Diamond is actually doing that, mm -hmm. They are going to shut down a portion of their market. Will those people eventually end up at DCBS or other mail order services? Yes, because they still want their comics. But you're taking from the culture of comic books, which right. is something all of us are willing to do is pay a little bit more to have the camaraderie of sitting at the comic book store on Wednesday with all of our buddies talking about comics and enjoying that atmosphere. If you like that, that's something you have to pay for. Right. You have to, you have to put a little bit more money into it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now, I'm not going to tell anybody how to buy their books. Everybody knows their own budget and what they can afford and how they want to spend that money. If you want a greater volume of books and therefore you're going to order it from a mail order service, mm -hmm. that's fine. You cannot then get online and talk about how tragic it is that comic book stores are shutting down because you are directly affecting that right. in your own neighborhood. Yeah. And see so the thing, and, and and keep in mind, DCB service they they still operate with Diamond distributors, right? Like they're not getting their books straight from Marvel or right. DC. They're going through Diamond as well, but they're they operate like a local comic shop. But their neighborhood is literally America, <laughs> like because right. they, they, they can ship everywhere and they make up a lot in shipping. But where this where this comes from and what what gets me and, and I absolutely agree with what Craig said because I like I could save a lot of money every week if I went through that. I pay more because I enjoy sitting at the shop. I enjoy the culture, but the, the industry is changing, right? It, like it's not just the market is changing. The entire industry is right. evolving. And this is where diamond and the direct market fails, Sucks. fails, ultimately fails. It's its position in the industry because it's got a monopoly on it. They're the only distributor and they can do what they want. And that's hurting the small store. Like, you have a whole internet troll movement about, oh, it's diversity that's destroying these small stores. And it's like, no, it's, it's fucking money that's destroying yeah. the small stores. The industry and the market is evolving. And unfortunately, comic stores have to find a way to evolve with it. Your brick and mortar mom and pop shops have to find a way to evolve with it or they're going to go out of business because at the end of the day, up for a lot of people, their wallets speak louder than their, like, you know, if, if, I mean, straight up, dude, if I did not have the opportunity to come hang out at Kapow, if Kapow wasn't that service for me, if it was just me coming to shop once a week, picking up my book, spending five minutes and leaving, not knowing you guys, I wouldn't feel bad about switching to DCBS at all. And that, that's the most people. Well, and so the thing is, is that what we've noticed with our guy, with Kapow, we'll, we'll just stay there but since I, but since you went there. He's had to to evolve, and it's something it took him a minute to react to the market right. to. And it, he struggled for a couple of years, and to be quite honest, Probably almost shut down the store a couple of yeah. times during the past couple of years. But he's evolved. He started selling video games a couple of years ago. That didn't really work out for him. Um, he's now evolved. he's now selling toys. Mm -hmm. He's selling uh, vintage toys and new toys. And comic book stores are going to have to sell 
more than just comic books to to stay alive for one thing well and a lot of shops have moved to being card shops as well like i know like for my my buddy who lives in macon georgia his shop exists it's a comic shop but it exists because of the pokemon and magic the gathering guys like or he would have had to shut down and it's it's, you have to know your market what's around you um so, so maybe you have a large market for hero clicks, right? Or you have a large market around you for for card games, or you have a large market for board games, or or whatever it is, uh, toys and collectibles in yeah. general. The problem with some of these comic book stores is that they still are buying their toys from Diamond as well, right? Because it's easier for them to get it from one place. The problem with that is, is that Diamond's three or four months behind on the collectibles, mm-hmm. and they're paying a double markup because yeah. they're paying do- diamonds margin and then they're paying theirs to in order to to get it to you. So then people go, well, I'm not going to pay $800 for this when I can buy it for 500 on on Amazon and get it before they get it. And get it, it before yeah. they yeah. have it. I, I had the uh, the same issue uh, and it's even worse whenever you're buying stuff like uh, foreign toys and stuff like that because um, and and Sean can attest to this too. I um, I was getting these figures there were portrait of pirate figures for right. one piece and everything. And, you know, they would have a release date for them in the previews and everything, which, you know, their release date is still after when it's supposed to release. And half the time it was a 50, 50, if they even came in. And then it was also a 50, 50, like if they were even going to come, Hell, I'm still waiting on my touch and coma model kit. Yeah. <laughs> that was two years ago. Yeah. But I mean, it's just, there's toys, mm. t-shirts, swags, Stuff like that. And I think, like you said, what Matt eventually did, Cabal, sorry, I gave his name out. <laughs> He'll be all right. He'll yeah. be all right. He don't listen. Uh, has evolved into the toy. He tried the video game thing for a little while. And yeah, I mean, you just, you have to evolve with the times. And if it wasn't just, you know, the issues of, uh, Diamond having the monopoly, then of course someone eventually is going to try a different way. And this company is definitely doing that. And I mean, it's already, I mean, they've already had issues just with digital comics in general also. It's, hitting a bit of the of the local of your actual brick and mortar comic shop. Yeah. So the comic industry itself is evolving with digital market. Um we're finding out that the younger generation, even younger than than you guys mm-hmm. at this table, but me being the old man. Yeah, my nieces. Yeah, the the ones that are young twenties, late teens right now, early twenties, late teens, they prefer to buy trade paperbacks. Yep. They don't want the floppies. Which is fine. It's your way to collect. It's your way to read. I don't care as long as you're reading it. But the comic industry has been slow to react to that. We find out they cancel a lot of books because the floppy sales are bad. And then the first trade hits and it's like, oh, wait, this book was actually popular. Yeah. And that's how come we get three different starts for the same book sometimes in a year. Because it, they look at it as, oh, it's failing. But guess what? When the trade hits, people it's buy a, it. It's a huge hit. Yeah. And for for kids like my nieces, you know, I have a I have a nine and an eleven year old niece. They read digitally. Like, the, and I buy them physical copies. They love it. But at, at school, they learn to read on a tablet. They mm-hmm. read their stuff on the tablet. Like, it's not yeah. like us who grew up with books, right? Um, and and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a valid way to read. A lot of people like to shit on it. If that's the way you know how to read, and that's the way you know how to read comics or anything else, that's the way you do it. Like, I, I've started well, reading digitally now just because it's convenient. Well, the but, movie industry is the same thing, right? A few years ago, Blockbuster went under because they didn't evolve with what Redbox was doing. For sure. Redbox is now going under because... Of the most same as the vi- is video games, yep. people don't want a wall full of DVDs in their house when yeah. they can have a Voodoo account or a Plex or whatever, and, and have all the games. Well, we do, but we're collectors, <laughs> right? Sure. Like that's part of who our person is. It was right there. I had. Well, for me, for instance, <laughs> I was hugging my DVD gift from Caleb when he said, that. <laughs> I, "I'm always going to buy Star Wars on on Blu-ray or right. whatever the latest media is when it comes out because I'm a collector of Star Wars stuff. I'm not going to buy." all five diehards on Blu-ray so that I can lug them around with me for the rest of my life. Right. Right. Well, and, the, and to move it back to town of TKO, which is the the, right. the center of this conversation, it's interesting what they're doing because they, they are the most modern comics, but new comics publishing company that I've seen in a long time, because what they did is they rolled out their books. They said, Hey, we're going to, we're, we're kind of following a Netflix model for comics. You can get either one, like, like the book, Sarah, 
You can get the book, Sarah, which is, by the way, from all accounts, from what I'm hearing, it's an amazing World War II sniper book with uh, female Russian snipers. Go check that shit out. It's on my list of things I want. Um, but you can you can order it as a full trade paperback right now today, or you can right now today order right. it as six single issues, or you can read it digitally. And they're not going through Diamond. You order it straight from their website. You go through Amazon. You go through any other thing. But they're giving a middle finger to the direct market. Well, and it's similar to Shonen Jump, right? With their two dollar right. charge. Yeah, yeah now they're with like, their uh, yeah digital and it's our entire library because yeah. they were publishing Shonen Jump here in English, but it was a month or two behind because of translation time. And I don't think it just did very well. People would rather just buy the individual manga. But uh, I don't know. It's kind of like, while well, thinking about this, like, TKO may be uh, starting something big. Because you think about it like this. Diamond is cable. Yeah. You know, it's cable. You got all your channels. Everything is through us. But TKO is starting Netflix. Mm -hmm. Will DC become Hulu? Will Image start being you know, any other streaming service? Or they just start distributing their own shit? Well, and they and that's what I'm saying is they yeah. could, and I don't know what that does to the local comic shop when you get rid of when you circumvent that direct market. So, so the way that Diamond is not considered a monopoly mm -hmm. is because technically you can buy all of your books direct from Marvel or right. DC uh, and probably every other publisher you could you could order a subscription service directly from them mm -hmm. that's how diamond gets a around it those companies have got to be the ones to step in and say and stop it well yeah and and i think a lot of them well like they're viewing it as an avenue there it's just one avenue of they distribution they have one place to sell they know how much to put print because of diamond's orders right so they know how much to print and how much to, to produce. For them, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. The problem is they're killing their own industry. Well, and DC owns Diamond. I, if I'm Marvel, not, Marvel owns Diamond. Yeah, I knew it was one of them. So but anyway, just I, I think this is a really cool thing. It's it's showing once again how this industry is evolving. We're getting away from the like, and comic shops have to evolve with it. They have to get away from. They they have to quit working on outdated models. Um, publishers are no longer financially or fiduciarily inclined to do their own is. he's a douche <laughs> <laughs> no, um, they have a fiduciary they do not have a fiduciary responsibility that means they are not responsible to their to the money they have coming in to do right. the promotions for the local comic shops they promote themselves and how you go get their like how you go get their product is up to you but they're not promoting local comic shops like they used to when that was the only avenue. So there's this kind of evolution in the market happening. TKO recognizes that. These two guys, and I forget their names um, that, that, that are investing in it, but just it's a really smart, solid business plan. And just to launch the way they did it, we're like you're offering the most ways to read, the fastest resource, you're avoiding the problems that a lot of people have. And like their rollout, I know you said you didn't see anything about it. Like I got on Twitter the other day, the day that it rolled out, and literally, I, New York Times posted an article, mm. Comicsology posted an article. Like there were so many outlets just promoting this. Like Comic Twitter blew the fuck up. Like yeah. it, everybody would like, and you know, uh, oh, that's probably my problem. Is I'm not on Twitter well, enough, I, but that well for your own peace of mind, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if oh, yeah. nothing else. Unless yeah. you want Lance Rance to return <laughs> next year, let's encourage Craig to get back on Twitter. <laughs> All right, so moving on to some other news. Uh, we had some TV news that came out this week. Uh, a couple different things, TV and movies. Um, a Doom Patroller. A Doom Patrol trailer. Doom Patroller. <laughs> Doom Patroller. <laughs> no, 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 no. Also, Doom Patroller. also staying in the show. Uh, new <laughs> hashtag trademark uh, Doom Patrol Doom yeah, Patrol there was a Doom Patrol trailer <laughs> that was released uh, and I think the release date was set right now, Jerry you I think watched this and you got a real big kick out of it right I uh, well see I, I watched the um, Titans episode right that they did and and it was basically your um, your first little foray into their live action stuff mm -hmm. and uh, I fucking dug it. Uh, I'm 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 ready for the actual show. Uh, it it did kind of surprise me because I didn't know that they were going to have Cyborg in, and I don't know when that was announced. But I uh, I don't you know, remember hearing about that. Yeah. Titans. Yeah. Or, no. Uh, no. In, in Doom, Doom Patrol. Patrol. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was he, he ever was, in Doom Patrol? Yeah. It, uh, no. Not that I know of. Mm. I know but Beast um, Boy whenever it whenever yeah, it shows, well, I mean, it, it kind of yeah. works um, yeah. with how they all the characters are because he is kind of like a sort of a tragic character, right? Like with everything yeah, that he's yeah. been in and how I mean, he got this body honest, and everything. Almost every cyborg every animal superhero yeah. is a tragic yeah. character. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sean. And I don't know the Doom Patrol characters at all. I've yeah. never read it. But uh, do we need Cyborg and a guy called Robot Man that's, on the same see, team? See, that's kind of where I was. <laughs> cyborg has to be in everything with DC. I guess everything. So. It's, <laughs> I, I, it's about he, annoying. I'm, yeah. 
I'm I'm down I'm down for the show and everything. Um, and I I mean you know what they could be doing with Cyborg there is you know making that his thing to get him into Titans or something. Yeah, well, um, pretty I'm much. sure it could. Yeah. That would at least be. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. Least. Yeah. Um, and it's it, just just to clarify, it's a different actor. It's not the same guy who played it in yeah. the Justice League, right? Um, so you got a new actor, a little bit of a new, almost more traditional look to him. And, as and well. he's and he's it a lot, does, a lot more, younger too. Yeah, more eighties look because he's mm-hmm. uh he's got he has hair on top of his head, right? He's not mm-hmm. clean shaven. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, definitely a little bit more. I seen a, a brief picture. I haven't mm-hmm. even watched the trailer yet. But it did look like a more of a throwback to the classic Titan, Teen Titans comic. Yeah, cool. the the teaser was pretty much just them all standing, uh, like in line for a picture. It looked like it was for like a holiday picture or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It was because it was, you know they're a family and everything, uh, living in the house. They're just like the misfits or whatever. So, so speaking of holiday pictures, mm-hmm. don't ever let your friends tell you that it's a ugly sweater. <laughs> party without confirming that Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that happened on social media this week. Ryan Reynolds um, apparently is really good friends. Well, I knew he was friends with Hugh Jackman, but uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is in their little group of friends as well. Invited him to a party and they told him it was an ugly sweater party, except that it wasn't. And everyone else was dressed fairly nice in fairly decent clothes. And Ryan showed up in this. He, he won the ugly Christmas sweater party. Uh, it was ugly. It was it was not pretty. Um, and I, I the, according to the pictures that he posted, he was uh, not amused. <laughs> he, uh, I'm sure he was just playing for the pictures, I'm though. Sure but it, it, uh, it, it, you know, that's cool. I like seeing those guys outside of the movies, just right. being human beings. But Doom Patrol, I'm interested in that. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm never been a huge fan of the books. I, I like Grant Morrison, hit and miss for me. Mm-hmm. Doom Patrol, the, the newer one was okay for a minute, and it kind of lost its steam. The there. Gerard Way book? Yeah. The, yeah, the Grant Morrison one got really fucking wacky. Yeah. Imagine I, that. I don't, yeah. I don't know who uh, wrote it at the time, but there's a part of me that feels I need to go get the Eric Larson drawn run, mm-hmm. which I don't think was a whole lot of issues, but yeah. Eric Larson did draw Doom Patrol for a I'm bit. sure it was Grant Morrison because it was during that same time frame, I'm sure. Yeah. But but speaking of Titans though, like real quick before we move on, just I've been hearing that show is really picked up and yeah, I'm I mean, hearing I need to things. get back on it. Uh, yeah. the the last thing that I remember seeing the preview for it was with Batman. Yeah, yeah. like so, and like I'm just see, seeing critic reviews. Apparently, I mean, we talked about the show when it was coming out, what before it came out, and then when mm-hmm. it actually came out, and mm-hmm. I certainly wasn't high on it at all. Mm-hmm. Sounds like I need to give it a try. It sounds like they're really picking up steam on it. I I will say that that Doom Patrol episode of it that I watched didn't make me interested enough to to watch Titans. Right, right. But I'm know, just saying, as yeah. a Teen Titans guy. Oh yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It sounded like they're doing a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. If Mark. I could watch it while I was playing Red Dead Redemption, <laughs> you, need, you need two TVs. Like I read comics and watch Roger watch TV. That's what I do. That's why I switch um, for life, son. But Sean, that's a good that's a good way to segue into another um, kind of thing that happened this week. And we'll, we actually have one in the middle, but we'll come back to it. Um, we didn't like the, I think the three, three out of four of us, uh, maybe four out of four. I'm not sure. None of us were really big on the Titans trailer when it came out because it did not fit the tone of what we like. We, we were very confused. Um, but it turns out it seems like critical acclaim and the way people are, are digging it that we, that you couldn't trust that trailer. Right. Um, there was another trailer that dropped for a film this week that I think is hot fucking garbage, <laughs> but I know other people really, Jerry, I think really liked the trailer and that's the trailer for Hellboy for this new Hellboy reboot. Uh, it's got yeah. the the guy who played the sheriff in Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. And McShane. Ian McShane. No, Ian it does McShane have Ian McShane is, in it, is Dr. Broomhold. Mm-hmm. I forget what the, the guy's name. Anyway, right. he's Hellboy. Something. I was not impressed. <laughs> in, so in I was kind of meh about it because to me it comes across as a buddy cop movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's just a poorly designed trailer mm-hmm. uh, because Hellboy is a funny you know he cracks jokes while he's doing stuff so i think they focused on the joke cracking right. instead of on the horror aspect of it yeah. there are some very cool design stuff that i like the him with excalibur with the cross between his horns was mm-hmm. awesome to me so there was some really cool stuff that i did like about it but overall i had a very meh feeling about it yeah craig and i craig and i actually talked about it on the way to dalton's wedding uh the other day and it almost felt like the same person that directed the Guardians trailer directed this. I feel like if it wouldn't have had money, money in the trailer, then it would have been like 80 times better. Cause like I, I was, I was into everything that I was seeing. My only little nitpick was he didn't have the, uh, the top knot, which kind of bugged me a little bit. But I mean, I, I enjoyed the rest of it. It was just like the song did not give me a good tone for what the movie was supposed to be like. 
what the trailer struck me as it's the first I don't know, full trailer or teaser trailer. I don't know what it was classified under. I felt like it was completely marketed to people who only ever watched the movies. Like, they were trying... And what do we remember a lot about the first movies besides, you know, the cool monster design? But it was, like, kind of a dark comedy at times. Yeah. And I think this first trailer was just to hook everyone in to kind of remind you of the Del Toro films. Now, does that mean the whole movie is going to be like that? Maybe. But, like, as we've seen, trailers don't always show you, especially the first trailer, doesn't always show you what the actual product's going to be. I think it looks amazing. Like, the uh, the prosthetics, the special effects all look great. Like I said, it is, like, they are, I think they are focusing on the comedy, which mm-hmm. can definitely turn people off. Like, Caleb. I think that's all they're side. focusing on. <laughs> right. For the first, I'm talking about for the first trailer. No, I, I, don't, I don't know that the yeah. show's going to be bad. I'm saying the trailer was bad. Right. Like it's, yeah, that's what I mean. And it's like, kind of like I said, it, I can, it didn't turn me off like Titans did, but I can see why it would turn some people off, especially if you've read Hellboy. Mm-hmm. While well, I say he is a wisecracking guy, it's not a light hearted no. uh, book. Right. They are dark books, so. I'm hoping it's going to have a, a better balance with the trailer showing, but I can see why some people are turned off by it. Okay. So one thing that I will say, there was a, Jerry and I talked about this too. There was a lack of Abe in this. Mm-hmm. There was no Abe. They said I can't. I'll try to remember his name. The, Abe, Abe Sapien. Sapien. No, no, the the, the, the Asian guy with oh, the scarred face. Uh, I can't like, think of it. But that's the character. From, that's the character from the books that was not in the last movies. Yeah. So uh, hopefully they're it's, expanded it's Ben more. Daimyo. Yeah, yeah is it. is his name. So yeah, like. Yeah. I'm hoping even more so in maybe another trailer or in the actual movie we'll get more of the BPRD. Yeah, so. I'm really hoping for Roger and um, Johan. I'm hoping for a film that's the complete 180 opposite of what that trailer was. Right. Because <laughs> uh, I watched that trailer back to back with the new uh, Will Ferrell Sherlock trailer. I'm like, oh, look, the same person made these trailers. And that's not Which, good for Caleb because I fucking hate Will Ferrell. And that's the thing, though, too, is you may not be wrong depending on like the, who – because people who cut trailers, I've yeah. discussed oh, this before – are not ha- could have nothing to do with the film. Right. They're just given by the marketing team. Make it like this. Yeah. They usually so, work for the well, for the film company, right? Not- so hopefully, and like hopefully. we like we always say, I, like, like, I'm going to I'm not going to say this is a bad movie. I don't know that I haven't right. seen the movie. I will wait. I will go see the movie. I'm going to wait. Mm-hmm. I just, this trailer yeah, did yeah. not make me right. want to go see this movie at all. Is uh, it, and it's David Harbor. He's, okay, he's the yeah. one that's playing it. From yeah. Uh, yeah. It looks good. David yeah. Looks something. looks yeah. really good. I I was a little on the fence about. About whenever they first started showing moving images and stuff of like all the prosthetics on his mm-hmm. face a little bit, but I, I'm pretty sold on it. I they, also think it's not a finished product. It's yeah. a teaser trailer. Right. You're not seeing the finished mm-hmm. prosthetics and the finished design. This there was like I said some very cool elements that I saw in that that I, that had me excited. Um, we'll see how it plays out. I'm gonna watch it. It's Hellboy. I love the BPDRC yeah. BPRD stuff and the Hellboy stuff. And I was telling Jerry. I actually hope that they do four or five movies mm-hmm. and then actually give us Hellboy in Hell. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I I don't know if you guys know much about uh, the Daimyo character, um, but he's got some other shit going on, and yeah. I'm I'm hoping that they bring some of that to the surface in this movie too. Yeah. Been a while since I read. I read yeah. a lot of the early Hellboy yeah. stuff. Uh, I don't want to spoil it just yeah. in case they yeah, do yeah, stuff. Yeah. It's been a while. I yeah. want to see it, though. Yeah. I'm definitely well, interested. And just because Jerry was excited about this trailer, of course, some other news had to come out that just really sunk his spirits. And we found out this week that uh, Jerry's beloved series, uh, Brian K. Vaughn's Paper Girls, is sadly coming to an end, uh, which is just unfortunate. So, but that, all great things must come to an end eventually, <laughs> right? Are you and I the only two reading that? I guys? read it in paperback. Or I read it in trades. Trade. Yep. I fell off. I just, okay. it, it wasn't holding It's me. a really, it, I, I like the nostalgia, the 80s rompiness of it. Well, see, it gets way away from that, too. Does it? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's all over. I mean, it's time travel. It's all right. over the place. Yes, it's got, I mean, there's 80 references, especially in the first couple of trades. But the book has a finite story. If you, if I'm caught up on it. At the most, it could have is two story arcs left. So this news didn't surprise me at all because based on where it's at in the story, it's it's got to finish. It's you know there's certain books when you're reading them, you know that they are a contained story that they're not going to be ongoing right, forever. Right. And that's the way this book is. I feel like Brian K. Vaughn has got some projects going on that's paying him a lot more than what comics are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Brian K. Vaughn's probably the, one of the few people that I think is probably making over upper six figures at, to write comics. But uh, you look at his other stuff that he's that were comics. Saga is big pause. Like they're just not. Yeah, yeah they're taking it. They, they said a year. a year. Who knows Maybe if that's. The, yeah, it could be more. He's ending this. I, I got a feeling that there's some, it could be movie stuff. There's there's something going on. But again, but again I don't want to act like he's ending this. This isn't a choice like, okay, I'm going to cut this. Sh- 
this story is telling yeah, his story. Yeah, he's just told he told his story. Yeah, right. but he hasn't never, announced anything else. Right. Yeah, it's, come, it's clear that it never was intended to be an ongoing permanent series. Well, like, it, he it, had a story. I mean, I know it's been going on for a couple of years now. Right. You know what I mean? Like this isn't like Justin Jordan coming out and saying, "Hey, I really love to bring this spread book to you," right. but the sales have determined that I need to go ahead and end it now rather than tell these side stories. Right. Because I want you to see hear, see the ending of it. So that's not what this is. No, for this sure. This is the story's just over. The story's just over. Yeah, yeah. I don't so. Well, very cool. Uh, and so, like I said, there's a lot more news going on that we you know we don't have time to talk about on the show. Uh, we don't have the room in the, the podcast to do. Would love it if you did. If you want to send us a check that we can add more uh, room on the listen <laughs> account, that'd be rad. I'll let you know. Email me. I'll, I'll get in touch check with you. Check out our that. Patreon and <laughs> go find me a page. No, yeah, someday we've got our fingers <laughs> we'll, crossed. We'll do a Patreon at some We're point. We're going to grow up and be big boys at some point in time. <laughs> uh, but we've got some other stuff to talk about right now. So it is the Sunday before Christmas. For all of you people who are having a holly jolly happy time of the year, uh, we wish you safe and merry holidays. Um, you know, if you're traveling to go see family, do it safely. But wouldn't be right if we did a podcast the Sunday before Christmas and we didn't talk about some Christmas stuff, right? right you can't do sure. that. It, 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 that's a law, right? Like, there's a rule. Right. I'm pretty sure we'll um, get arrested otherwise. I think so. Yeah, there, there are podcasts. There is a war on Christmas right now. I know. I'm leading the charge. <laughs> 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 I personally have crucified Santa upside down at least four times. But anyway, so normally we have listener questions, right? We have uh, a place on our Facebook page that um, has been displaced right now for reasons we'll get to later. But uh, we, we like to get questions from people who listen to the show. It gives us topics to talk about. I put those to the side this week because I wanted to bring some Christmas questions that we haven't gotten any to the table for us to kind of round table about. And you guys failed. You let us down, people. I, well, to questions. be fair, I didn't ask for them. You can't be mad about an it's answer. True. You didn't. It's my fault. I, I take hey, look, the burden. It is your fault. We publish this on the internet. We can be mad about anything we damn well. Want. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's that's a valid point. Um, but let's let's get into these things. So let's talk about some Christmas stuff that have to do with the geek world. Yeah. Um, what is you guys is I'm not sure what the plural is of that. What is your favorite holiday Christmassy type movie? Craig, what you got, buddy? Mine's it's a, it's a Wonderful Life. Ooh, I'm, classic. I'm, I'm the old one, and I'm mm-hmm. going to go the old school. Right. Well, that's a classic it, for a reason. Yeah. It, it as far as a drama type Christmas movie, that's just. Probably my favorite. It, it, it's everything about it's a Christmas. Classic. Yeah, it, it is a classic. It's yeah. phenomenal. So that's my well. So I'm the second old man in this group here. I'm going to go into my 80s era of my childhood. And that's motherfucking Gremlins. Ooh, yeah. my I, favorite it, Christmas movie. Short list for sure. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's always on my list. It's I mean, he gets he gets Gizmo for Christmas, and while it may take place afterwards, so you could argue. Some people like to argue if it's a Christmas movie or not. Fuck you, it's a Christmas movie. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it was an early Christmas gift. It was an early Christmas. It was early. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. Christmas yeah. Day, I, I, uh, I just, just, just wanted to see it in a box one at a time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, the the girl's story of why she hates Christmas, dude. Ooh, right, shit. just a sudden darkness. Yeah, yeah, I love I love Gremlins. Very cool. What yeah, you got, Jerry? Since you're the third oldest. Oh, okay. Um, so mine is a mine is not necessarily a geeky Christmas movie, but it's a movie a Christmas movie I geek out about. Uh, it's called The Family Stone. It was made in 2005. I like that movie. Yeah, love it. it sounds familiar. It's uh oh, it's really good. So it's directed by Thomas uh, Bichuza. It's got kind of an all star cast. It's uh, Craig T. Nelson plays the dad, and Diane Keaton plays the mom. Um, there are all like Sarah Jessica Parker's in this movie. Luke Wilson's in this movie. There's a ton of people, and so essentially the deal is. It's a family gathering for Christmas, and one of the sons, I think it's Luke Wilson's character, it's, been, it's hard to find, actually. I need to break out my copy. Um, but he brings his very uptight, semi-conservative girlfriend back home to his parents. And his family is a very like neoliberal family. Like uh, The mom wanted all of her kids to be gay, but only got one gay kid. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's kind of this culture shock and figuring out that she didn't need to be with him. She actually hooks up with one of the other brothers. It's a thing. Fantastic movie. I love Diane Keaton. It's it's great. It's like I said, me being a gay dude, it's got a very big gay kind of theme as part of it, like family acceptance. It always touches home, um, especially for somebody who, you know, just getting into a little bit of my thing. I can't take my partner home for Christmas to my parents. So that like I, I love that movie. It hits me I, right in the Christmas fields. I don't know why I never think of that one as a Christmas movie. It absolutely is, yeah. but in my mind, it never comes up as hey, that's a Christmas movie. And I love that movie. Yeah, so. it's it's just a feel good with an all star yeah. cast, man. Being the the baby of the podcast, put your head um, back on. No, and your glasses. Is <laughs> that Jerry over there? <laughs> no, it's just some other fuck. <laughs> 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 
Oh, the Long Island Ice Teeth is trying to hit. <laughs> um, no, so the 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 movie that I love the most um, growing up, uh, Jingle All the Way with Wait, Arnold. How did I fucking know? It was well, I, did, I, I, I I had to. How did I fucking know? Fucking Krampus yeah. was the shit. Krampus was I amazing. love that movie. Um, but no, um, you know, at that time I was like really really getting big into like collecting action figures and toys. And then this movie came out and it's pretty much about Arnold Schwarzenegger chasing this, uh, turbo man toy around all over the place with freaking, uh, was it Sinbad? Sinbad. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it was so great. Um, so it's always on my list every year to, to watch. And, uh, I actually had a turbo man, uh, whenever I was growing Badass. up. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't yeah. actually, I, I knew, I thought that they had made some of those. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really sure that it's so. turbo time. <laughs> Side note, because I get wrestling in any chance that I can, the huge Santa in that movie was Big Show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there are there any other, like, runner-ups for you guys? Mine, uh, if I had to do a runner-up, it'd be Mickey's Christmas, not Christmas, well, Mickey's Christmas Carol, but uh, the, there's another. Roger makes me watch Mickey at Christmas. I forget what it's called. <laughs> Christmas Vacation, Christmas Story, both are. You know, every year I watch those. I'm gonna be that corner of the internet and still argue that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. <laughs> you get Gremlins and Die Hard. You yeah. you are that corner. Well, I'll, I'll continue to be that. Yeah. Their uh, Christmas movies. Scrooged is always a must watch for me. Um, like I said, Krampus. Krampus. Fucking Amazing. love the shit out of Krampus. Movie. Uh, and then Jim Carrey's The Grinch. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot go Christmas without watching. We that. watched that the other day. Uh, yeah. Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Emmett Otter. Remember that? Am I the only one that remembers him? The daughter of the James rings a bell, but I'm not familiar. Yeah, he had the. You're old. Yeah, <laughs> it was Muppets, man. And, and shout oh. out to every single anime that had a Christmas the, episode the, in there. The Muppet Christmas Carol. Yeah, Whew. any Christmas Carol was yeah. usually pretty good. Yeah. There's a lesson there, kids. Yeah, mm-hmm. about <laughs> about that it takes uh, supernatural elements to actually make rich people <laughs> realize that they the should get out of someone to get them to change. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get into some art stuff. Uh, you get one original piece of art, one piece of original comic art, manga art, can be anything, whatever, in your stocking. Who is the artist and what is it of? I'll take an Alex Roth, Ross Darth Vader. Nice. That'd be dope. That'd be real dope. Well, you said it in the uh, your build up to that. A, any one piece of art that you can get, <laughs> it would definitely be a, a drawing a buggy from H.R. Oda, from nice. one, creator of One Piece. And for all you Americans out there, I'll take a Harley Quinn by Bruce Timm today. <laughs> uh, I want a Beta Ray Bill by Mignola. Ooh. That'd be cool. That would yeah. be awesome. It'd be very I've cool. had a lot of time to think about this question. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, yeah, I think we all have. So if I could get one piece, it would be... It's actually a specific piece that was actually you published. You would be the Pirate King. Huh? You would get the, you, <laughs> if you could get one piece, you'd be the Pirate King. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't like care. it. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Jerry was a good one. That was a good one, Jerry. <laughs> Merry I feel, Christmas. I, feel, I, you guys, you. I don't want to play this game. Anymore. All right. Anyway, so it would be a George Perez double page spread from Avengers volume three, number one. So there's a scene in that book where it's right after Avengers disassembled. If you guys remember that run where they're getting the team back together. It's one of those stories that Sean loves. But essentially Jarvis and the big three, Thor, Cap and Iron Man, they get everyone who has ever been an Avenger kind of in the same room, including D-Man who at the time had been living in the sewers with the Morlocks and just smelled really bad. And so they're set up in this kind of movie theater-like auditorium while they get spoken to by the big three. And it's just like D-Man in the center with no one sitting around at all. (laughs) Everyone curled on the edges. I love that. I would kill somebody for that piece of art. Uh, So that would be mine. If I could get one piece in my stocking. Did that anybody one. do eighties hair better than George Perez? Oh, nobody. No. Just <laughs> big curls. I mean, there's, there's a reason Starfire's hair is like. Oh, Scarlet Witches, man. Yeah. That's yeah. Just mm-hmm. big eighties, just curls for days. Yep. I love it. Yep. He's he's my favorite comic artist, man. He's yeah. like still he's, to this day. He's up. He's definitely in the top three. I just want to meet him so bad. I haven't had a chance to meet him yet. Uh, it bugs me. <laughs> so, all right. Santa believes in forgiveness, right? Yeah. Like Santa and Jesus, that's kind of their thing. <laughs> well, he punishes. Uh, aren't they the same person? <laughs> well, I, I mean, depending Santa on who you ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> so because in the spirit of Christmas, the, the in the spirit of making all things right again, Santa hires a supervillain to help him run his workshop. Say, Mrs. Claus, they made enough money. She's wanting him to take a little bit of time off. He needs somebody to help him out at the shop, right? So he hires a supervillain or an ex-supervillain. To help take care of the elves and stuff. Get everything in line. Make sure Christmas happens for all the boys and girls. And he hopes that they'll catch the Christmas spirit. Who do you think he hires? 
I think he hires Magneto because he can use his powers of magnetism to get stuff from one end of the factory to the other easily. Kind of speed up the industrialization process. Yeah. yeah. Mine is simply because of his name. He he would hire a toy man. <laughs> uh, damn. Valid point. <laughs> that's, I, got, I won. That's yeah. like, <laughs> shit. <I> <laughs> Son of a bitch. That kind of is the, the most tinker. obvious answer. <laughs> I'm not too obvious. The tinker. Yeah. And no one thought of it. Yeah. No, it's the perfect answer that no one thought of. I, I just went with more of like, who needs forgiveness and the Christmas spirit like forced down their throat um, and fisted down their throat? Yes. what he just did. Um, Donkey maybe. punched that forgiveness. <laughs> into it. Uh, I actually, I actually went with Superboy Prime. Oh, oh, yeah, I went deep cuts. Wow, nice. Because yeah. that little shit, right? No, <laughs> not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I went with Mole Man. So okay, mo- you're in fucking mole man. Mo- well, no, think about it though. <laughs> mole man, he you know he needs some Christmas spirit. He he he's he's already good at controlling small gremlin like creatures, and that's essentially what elves are. Yeah. He's just a different. He he, it's like a different subset species. For somebody that hates Fantastic Four, he sure they have no, They have a great rogues gallery. They just need to be updated. It's because the only fan of Fantastic Four out there gave him a Thor. <laughs> yes, that's, that might be what. No, I don't. I don't want the Fantastic Four. I like everybody else around them. Right. Um. They need to be updated. But yeah, like he's, you know, he's industrious. He builds giant robots. He controls little small gremlin people. And that's what I think in my brain elves are. So I think Mole Man. Gremlin people. Yeah. (laughs) They're like the dark elves. So racist. They're the wood elves. So racist. It's uh, species. How does not speciest? Speciest. It's not even, it's not even a real species. It's a fake species. You don't know that. You haven't been to every corner of the world. I haven't been. (laughs) What if elves are penguins? Oh God! Well, uh, okay, penguins are next question. question. Penguins in the list. South Pole. The well dressed. That wouldn't be possible. Yes, uh, Carol the Bells is my favorite Christmas song. Oh, no, I actually Lord. like Carol the Bells too. That we yeah, did. Well, I skipped remember that one we because we had an entire conversation show. about how we were not going to do that. I, I literally <laughs> told you we're skipping that question. Hi, I'm Jerry. <laughs> He's Jerry and extra hard today. Uh, <laughs> well, fuck it. Let's go, uh, Craig. What's your favorite Christmas song, man? God bless him. Maybe it's cold outside. No, no. Oh God. Probably uh, podcast canceled. I, I really don't. I, Christmas music just really doesn't do it for me. Um, maybe heavy metal Christmas by Twisted Sister. Yeah, nice. That's a good one. I'm one of the few people that works in retail and is never minded when Christmas music comes on at the end of the year because it's better than the repetitious pop music they always play. Yeah, but I'm gonna always hold on to Little Drummer Boy. That's, yeah. my, that's my favorite. Christmas the Rumpa Bump Bum. Damn right. Yeah, being uh, a uh, a in choir for like nine years and <laughs> singing all the songs. Yeah. That's Carol the Bells is the only thing I can. Sing. It was one of my favorite ones from yeah. choir too. Yeah, and I mean TSOs. Oh, I love TSO. Yeah. Like that's yeah. the Christmas music I actually like listening to. Um, but you guys know how I'm weird, right? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we even know the true levels, but we know you're weird. <laughs> so, my favorite Christmas song is actually a Tom Waits song. <laughs> it's called Christmas Card from a Hooker in Minneapolis <laughs> Jesus by the amazing Mr. Tom Waits. I love this song. Because, it's one of, of course, the, it is your It's one of my Christmas. highlights. It's fantastic. Uh, awesome. So, that's mine. All right. So, moving on to the question that we weren't going to skip. Thanks, Jerry. Santa's not immune, right? Should he lives someplace. <laughs> we deleted it off I the know. list. <laughs> I know. You fucking fuck. It's Christmas. Have a little spirit. I do. I'm, I'm going to have more spirits when I get home. Um, so, can, Santa catches a cold, right? It's it, He went outside. His hair was wet or something. He caught one of the North Pole bugs. He's down. On, he's under the weather. What comic character fills in for him on Christmas and why? Why like, Why do you think they would fill in that role? Who does he call? Who's his backup? I think Jerry wants to go Nightcrawler. Banff Bowers? Fuck you. Oh! <laughs> why? We can, why? We can team up. <laughs> we can double can teleport. Up. That's the only reason. And teleport presents to everybody. That's the only reason. And he's, and he's so jolly. You're, you're, missing, you're missing the give, best give, reason. Give the big reason. Because he'll become the him. motherfucking Christmas elf. He would be the head elf. Because Wolverine always called him elf. Uh, Fuzzy elf. Fuck, fuck gotcha. the elf. Well, and he can teleport presents, <laughs> kids, and honestly, being the nice Catholic man that he is, he actually be a, like would step up and be the the givings type. I'm going with Superman because his his super speed and super strength would yeah. mean that everybody would still get their presents. That's a good one. Yeah. So I said multiple man. Yeah, huh. that's so, a good one. Also, you know, he just headbutts a thing a few thousand times. He makes a thousand billion million trillion dupes. Each one of them grabs their present and they go to one house and boom, it's done. Just like that. And they've got friends. So maybe they call, maybe they, they call night, night quality. Yeah, I know, right? But the extra, because Jamie, he's weird like because that. Because he's extra. He is extra. He's really extra. Especially in the X-Men series. Could you imagine what kind of hell that would be with that many Jamies running around in the world? No. 
I don't <laughs> like in, the, in one of the recent books. They actually there was so many Jamies they could see them from space. Yeah, yep. That's what happened. Yeah, that, that, that's 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 Christmas in in X Men. What World. about a uh, Silver Surfer? I like the I like the idea of Silver Surfer flying around on his board with a giant bag of gifts. I think <laughs> it, I think there's actually a picture. I think there's an art. I want to say a, yeah. a picture yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's you guys are just remembering it from the. Silver Surfer at Kapow. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Santa hat on Maybe it. that's what it is. That's actually Maybe. my Santa hat. All right. A really so long one. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas is the spirit of giving. It's the season where we get, you know, we, we associate presents with Christmas, right? It's a little late in the game to, to, you know, suggest things to go out and buy because you're hearing this the Sunday before Christmas. But I thought we'd talk about some stuff that we would all like to receive. You know, let's be greedy for a second. That's, that's what Christmas is all about, right? Capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, putting stuff <laughs> in our own pockets. That's, that's what it means to me. Uh, so let's talk about five, like we're all going to list five things that we want to get under the tree this Christmas, different products, things you can go out and buy. Maybe, maybe you get something for Christmas you don't like, you want to return it, get a gift card, some stuff you could buy. So let's start with number five and we'll go around the group like we did last, last week. Okay. Last, last year. year. I almost said last year. <laughs> last year. <laughs> words, words are hard. Um, so I'll start this off of your article with that. So my number five is Game of Thrones Monopoly. My husband collects Monopoly games. And that's like his only geeky thing. Like that's what it is. So I found a Game of Thrones Monopoly that I'm gonna. I'm putting that in my back pocket. He's not getting it this year, but he'll get it at some point. It's about forty bucks. Not too bad. Holy shit! There are two people in the world now. That I know, know, right? Him and Leland. Yeah. My, Roger loves Leland. monopolies. Wow. Loves monopolies. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Leland should, Leland should get married to Roger. No, <laughs> that's too much redhead in one house. <laughs> uh, my number five, I, I did this kind of as a, if I could have anything mm-hmm. in geek culture. My number five is the uh, Star Wars original Death Star playset from the 70s. That's Hell badass. Yeah. Uh, mine is something I think every geek can uh, can appreciate this kind of a gift. I want shelves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. I need shelving. I want enough space to put all my shit. Right. For the other <laughs> gifts. So we gotta get under the tree. But yeah. Number five, shelves. I would like to have a um common rider helmet. A real one? one or just a model? I, I know which one, but tell them. A real one. one. Either stronger or fours. Yeah. My my two favorites. Nice. I found this and I want it, and it's weird that I want it, but I really want it. Mm-hmm. It's an art of being Bill Murray coffee table book. <laughs> uh, it's about seventeen bucks. It. It was made by a fan that's just big coffee table book of Bill Murrayness, and mm. I think Bill Murray's awesome. He made comedy back in a time when comedy made sense, mm. not yeah. like this newfangled stuff that you people laugh at. I don't understand. What do you mean, you people? I mean, you people. <laughs> I don't get comedy; it doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> but I, I get Bill Murray, and I get coffee table books, and they're awesome. He is amazing. Mine would be. Uh, I'm really digging that new gallery PVC diorama collectibles. Any of those pieces, I'm down for. That was my number one. Was it? Yep. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> nice. I, I've, I've got steeper as I go up. Ah. <laughs> High five. The, the price gets higher as we go towards <laughs> number one. Uh, mine right now, I'm so obsessed with my Nintendo Switch. I just would love a Nintendo eShop card because there are so many indie games that are relatively cheap. Nice. Out there that I could just load up the multi hundred gig card that I bought so I can store up stuff. So yeah, Nintendo eShop gift card. I want a micro pig. Yes. Oh, like a, a real little bitty teeny tiny micro. Yep. Oh. I, like 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 a teacup. The, like teacup. the size of Apollo, but a pig. Now, a, pig. an Apollo is, is a, for those of you who don't know is a is a chihuahua. A chihuahua. Yeah. A chihuahua. That's what Stephanie called them when she was younger. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> little bitty. What would you name your micro pig? Hamlet. Hamlet. Of course, of course you would. He would. That makes perfect and sense. And get a little, we we little spent lot. a lot of time coming up with names for a pig. And we would, of course, have to buy a, a gift where it has some little wings strapped to it. What right? was the runner-up name? Actually, like, you pointed to me. Y'all had that name before I met It's got to be Wilbur. Oh, I wow, came in on yeah. y'all's creation. I guess so. Wilbur's got to be in the Wilbur? discussion of any pig Por- names. Porkins? Porkins. <laughs> Captain Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast. <laughs> All right, number three. Emergency food All right, ration. my number three. I'm actually scratching what I had and moving it up. Jordan, so Sean, you said shelves, right? Like yeah. utility. Mm. That's that's this one. Uh, I love these long boxes and short boxes that are drawer boxes. Oh. And Craig is kind of the one who turned me on to them. So instead of having like your average short box where you stack one on top of the other, you got to move four boxes to get to the bottom one. These things, they're they're sturdy. They're they're made out of really thick cardboard. You slide them open like a drawer. You can stack them four or five high, six high. I forget what it is. You can technically stack them six high, but yeah. I don't go over five. It's 
Yeah, but oh, you can yeah. get in there and you can find what you're looking for. You shift through without moving an entire stack of books. They're they're really well done. I think average price of what a long box is what ten bucks, twelve bucks, sixteen bucks. Uh, a short box, short box, drawer box. You're paying probably about twelve, fifteen dollars for yeah. the drawer and the box because you got to buy the box separate right. from the drawer. But they're they're really handy, especially live. You know, if you live in a in a house where you only have a small office, or you live in an apartment and you don't have the the space to dedicate to a thousand things. Just make an entire wall out of them, man. Yeah. It, it it works out really well and okay. really really good for collectors. That's or in my case, two storage walls. That's like the that's like the, the socks of the comic book gift. Like they're, right. you, they're right. the older we get, the more we're like, thank God you got me socks. Right. <laughs> What's your number three, buddy? Um, like Sean, mine is uh, PlayStation money. So yeah. for games for PlayStation, we need the games. Number three for me would be the. Um, the rest of the collected editions of Usagi Yojimbo. Ooh, nice. I've got oh, the nice. first two, and I need the rest still. I would love to get the rest of them. I want a page, an original page of uh, One Piece. Nice. nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know which one in particular, because uh, there's a lot. Yeah. But, yeah, that would be amazing. So, my number, I guess we're number twos now, right? Number yeah. two? All right. My number two... This is actually going to piggyback off of a gift that uh, Craig got me for my birthday. Yeah. Um, Craig got me, as I spoke of earlier, George Perez, all-time favorite comic artist. I love that man. Uh, he did my favorite Avengers run. He also is probably more so known for his run on Wonder Woman. Uh, that's He did Wonder Woman and Teen Titans. That's probably the big two. Avengers comes after that. Uh, but Craig got me the first Wonder Woman omnibus, the George Perez stories. For my birthday, and it looks great on my shelf. I love it. I can't wait to read it once I get through the rest of my box um, <laughs> of stuff I have to read. But the Volume 2 Omnibus came out, and I, I would love it. It collects Wonder Woman 25 through 45 and Wonder Woman Annual Number 2. It's about 50 bucks. I think. You can get it for... That's a good price you can get it for. Uh, oh, cool. and, and I want it. I want to finish out that collection. Very it's cool. George Perez doing Wonder Woman. It's awesome. My number two is a Gen 1 Megatron with the silver muzzle, not the orange muzzle. The get you shot muzzle. Uh, my one is a uh, fairly recent release, but I need it now, and I have a birthday coming up. Hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a glow in the dark All Might pop figure, which af- after uh, my ordered one that Matt's getting for me comes in, it'll be the only one I'm missing from having to complete my Hero Academia pop set. Nice. nice. Uh, they actually just, which is kind of funny because my number two, they actually made an All Might statue. I <laughs> seen it. Yeah, that's pretty badass. Yeah. So all right, number Red. ones. So my number one. Uh, it could be cheap. It could be expensive, depending on what the giver, how generous they're feeling. Uh, there is a website that makes t-shirts that I am in love with. It's called Ripped Apparel, R-I-P-T. And so what Ripped Apparel does is they do their, their shtick is they make a t-shirt design. They Usually they do two or three a day. They're only available for 24 hours or on special occasions for longer. And they're like nerd mashups. So, like, one of my favorite takes the, the the people from the Black Order, the villains from the Marvel villains, um, you know, from the Call of Obsidian, mm-hmm. from the, the the last big movie, and they pose them like the um, Freddie Mercury and Queen, yeah. like the, the four heads. Me and Rhapsody, yeah, they yeah. give them that yeah. pose. It's a, I think, was that, yeah, not at the opera, was yeah. that album, was You don't it? have that shit? No, I do have that oh, shirt. Oh, you do? Yeah, okay. it's one of my well, favorite shirts. you were Castro No, that's what they do. Like, they take <laughs> right. these things, they mash them up. Like, like it's just, it's hilarious. Like, they'll do a Godzilla mash, mashed up with King of the Hill, or just some random thing you wouldn't think of, and they're hilarious. And they're usually, like, 13 bucks. Right. And they can get them, you can get them any size. You can get them on t-shirts, you can get the design on coasters. If you want a shower curtain that's got that, like, sometimes they'll do, like, I don't know, they might do an All Might meshed up with the Gremlins, or who knows. Right, right. But, like, you can get a shower curtain. Or a, a duvet cover. It's craziness, and it's awesome. And I would love a gift card to that website right. for however much they wanted to put on there. If they want to put, you know, 13 bucks or 1300 bucks. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> it's Ripped Apparel. It's awesome. Right. Oh, that's good. Mine is for my extremely rich friends that want to get me something. <laughs> so not, a, not it. <laughs> it would be Amazing Fantasy 15. Nice. That's just a dream. But, you know. <laughs> uh, mine... <laughs> Do Dalton's next wedding. Maybe. <laughs> right. Just kidding. Just, just kidding. Oh, no. Sorry, Dalton. <laughs> it, won't, it won't matter. Mine should be a cheap gift, but people keep wanting to sell them for more than a dollar a piece. Uh, I just want someone to help me finish off my Savage Dragon collection. <laughs> very, big, very cool. Nice. I finally want that fucking first appearance of Agent Venom. Yeah, That oh, would be man. cool. Yeah. What is that? Do you know what that is? Off the uh, it was um, Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, let me see. 
545. I've got it in my phone. I can't remember yeah. off the top of my head. That, I want that issue of that comic that's on my number one list that I can't fucking remember the number of. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> go, go me. <laughs> Good, good job, Jerry. I know. You're, you're, how, are you hungover this morning, buddy? No. Me hungover? Are you kidding? <laughs> I love him when he's like this. He's right. so fun. <laughs> All right. Let's get some other covering comic a little bit, guys. So myself. I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas, man. Seriously, that, that's what the season's about. Go wh- Whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, give somebody something. Enjoy your food. Treat your family right. Treat your friends right. Just get together. Have a great time. That's all it's about, man. For so. sure. Um, from all of us here at the Southern Fried Geekery podcast, we you know we hope your stockings are full. We hope your spirits are bright. That's 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 what we want for you guys. Merry and Christmas, one and all. It was six fifty four. Six. You were close. You had numbers. Yeah, and it was in there. <laughs> there was a five. I think there was a five, maybe a four. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys ready to talk about some comics? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. We actually oh, are we're making not done really with the good. podcast. Yes. <laughs> you, need, you, you can go, go anytime you're ready. Go, sir. go tag in Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Tra- trade off. Um, all right, well, let's talk about some books that came out this week. Uh, this first one that we're going to roundtable, uh, I'm really excited about. It was a very interesting book. Um, so for those of you who may be new to the podcast, each week we talk about five comics on the show. We bring one book that we all read together and we roundtable about it. And then we each bring a book that we really liked. Uh, maybe the others have read it. Maybe they haven't. If not, no big deal. We just tell you about it. We have a 50-50 rule, um, so we're not going to ever talk about a comic that we just absolutely hated uh, just to drag it through the mud. We're not about that life. Who has time? Why, why waste that much of your life, that much energy, focusing on some negativity? We don't do it. So that's just kind of, if you haven't listened to the show before, welcome, and let's let's talk about some funny books. So this week, our roundtable book is Freedom Fighters Number 1 by Robert Vendetti, uh, Eddie Barrows. Art, uh, it was inked by Eber Ferreria. It was colored by Adronio, Adronio Lucas, and it was lettered by Darren Bennett uh, from DC Comics. Just real quick, what did you guys think about it? I really enjoyed it. Liked it? Yeah. Oh, definitely a uh, solid book. Like from the art to this, the concept alone is very interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I really dug it. It was fun. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think it was fun. Um, so four thumbs up. Yeah. Four, four, four thumbs up. I, I think it was great. So to give you a little bit of the story, for those of you who might not know what Freedom Fighters is, Freedom Fighters is a book that takes place on Earth X. Earth X is the kind of alternate universe where guys we didn't win world war ii the nazis did that's not good no, the Nazis. the Nazis. the Nazis. okay the, the, no, uh, seriously, was, yeah no i know i knew, I knew they, they were called that i just wasn't sure if that was just like a like a phrase on rat nazis or that mm-hmm. they were using or if they were as far as i can tell it's what they're calling them yeah so, so okay cool so the the Nazis who are mm-hmm. an analog for the nazis one and and literally led by hitler they don't they don't yeah. skimp on that part they won world war ii they took over the world and it's you know fascism reigns even in america and this book opens up in Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963. Oh, we know what that day is. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's John Kennedy Day. Uh-huh. Yeah. Ooh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's the day John Kennedy got shot. I did not make that connection. Yep. Look at you go. Deep cuts. Dang. Encyclop- I'm, the old, I'm the old man. Over here. Encyclopedia <laughs> Craig, man. So it opens up. There's a janitor who's moving off some graffiti that was covering up Hitler's face. And what's happening in here is there is a resistance movement. It's alive and well, um, or at least-ish. Uh, and it's that they are meeting in secret. You know, they do the whole code word thing. And when it opens, uh, opens the door up to a warehouse, um, these three or four figures come in and they are the resistance fighters. They're kind of some superheroes, these kind of Charlton esque figures. Black Condor is there. The human bomb is there. Toy Doll man. man. Doll man. Doll man. Yeah. Doll man, Doll man is there. And a, a real life historical figure. Jesse Owens, yeah, who won, if you remember, he won the Olympics in Germany right before World War II broke out. He has that really, really amazing picture of a black man standing flanked by two members of Germany who could have arguably been Nazis. And were uh, probably shot for not winning. Yep, and he beat them. Uh, he was the fastest man in the world at that time. Uh, anyway, so there's superheroes during this time. And so they're coming to this secret meeting to kind of get together, and they're planning on a number of things, trying to take over. Except they get infiltrated by a what was one of my favorite parts of the book. Hmm. They're infiltrated by a spy who doesn't necessarily look like a spy, who can make himself look like anything, who can be anywhere at any time. Uh, in this universe, there is no plastic man. There are plastic men with the yeah. SS being part of their names. Yeah. And they have disguised themselves as parts of the the furniture or the... 
yep. the room. Uh, one of them disguises himself as an American flag. They they spring a trap, man, and they take over and they arrest everybody. Um, all of them get captured. All of them, spoiler warning, get killed. Uh, and watching all of this at the time is one of the key figures from Earth X, one of the key figures from the Freedom Fighters world. It's Uncle Sam. It's And it's exactly what you think of when you think of Uncle Sam. It's the old man in the goatee in the just really Fourth of July patriotic outfit. He's a superhero in this world. And he's forced to watch it happen. Well, he kind of goes insane, and more plastic men show up to arrest him, and he just kind of fades away. Yeah. He just kind of dissolves into nothing, and he disappears. And he stays gone for 50 years or so. Um, then the book kind of springboards to modern times. Uh, there is a school. Some kids are outside playing baseball. They get stopped by the Gestapo or uh, the the Polizzi, I think is what they're calling them um, in that term. Get in trouble for playing baseball because baseball was the quote-unquote American sport, uh, so they, they're not allowed to do that. Um, you know, they go back into school. They're they're complaining. They're walking. Uh, some of the, the Nazi officers or Razi officers, whatever you want to call them, are walking through a museum of all of these kind of this, this ephemera of the, the American uh, fascist uprising and the, the day that they put down the Freedom Fighters, which is an annual holiday at this point. Like, they keep showing it on TV. It's... They're, they're walking through here, and it's just this, this this testament to their brutality a little bit. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, <laughs> just boom, it explodes. Yeah. No, nothing has happened with the resistance in fifty years, right? Like there's, it's been, it's it's been defeated. No one's looking out for this. And this museum, this testament to the Nazi occupation of America, goes boom. Uh, and everyone's looking around. How did this happen? What what's going on? There's these figures that look like the original freedom fighters that are back 50 years later. The human bomb gives a giant middle finger to the smoking, uh, smoking building of the bomb. And people are like, all well, woman instead of all man. Yeah. People yeah. are, yeah. People are like, I thought, I, I thought you guys were dead. And they're like, nope, the originals are, we're bringing this back. We're doing this one more time. We're, we're reviving this movement. Like the spirit of America is alive and well, if we keep it alive and well. But they're not exactly the same. There's been some changes. Black Condor is actually a black man uh, who looks a little bit like the Falcon. Uh, yeah. I got to be, be yeah. honest. Oh, absolutely. Um, the Human Bomb. We don't know who. We don't know who he or she is. We 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 don't. I do know that his belt buckle is shaped like a Green Lantern, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. though it's white. Oh, you're I don't right. know if you guys picked up on that. Nah, I thought I that was cool. Uh, there is another figure who wasn't in the original group. I don't think. Uh, and her name, the Phantom Girl or oh, Phantom yeah. Woman. And then Doll Woman, who was the wife of the original Doll Man, and they are bringing it back, and they're going to, they're gonna, they're they're going looking for Uncle Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam, yeah. So I don't know, words got really hard all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, I, the the book was fun for me. I found it very very interesting. So I'm kind of a a history nerd, and one of the things I realized right when I opened up this book, one of the first pages, um, if not the, it, I think it's actually the third page. This takes place in, like we said, the the 1950s. 1963. Yeah, 1963, uh, and this is this is after the World War II has ended. The Nazis won. The flag that they're they're saying the Pledge of Allegiance to has got 48 stars because Hawaii and Alaska wouldn't have been states at the time. They got that part right. Like the the artist nailed that part. But as they're saying the Pledge of Allegiance, one thing I notice is that they say "One Nation Under God." That wasn't put in there until Eisenhower put it in there way past the the war. And I found that interesting. Like, I wonder, I wonder if there is a Earth X thing. Like, there's a reason if there, if that's a plot point because I trust Robert Mundetti, right? Like, the dude knows his details. Eisenhower injected uh, the Under God part into the Pledge of Allegiance as a kind of blowback against communist Russia after the Russian kind of the Russian Spring. After I mean, if we want to get technical, the Russians are the one who beats the Nazis, not not mm-hmm. the U.S. It was it was the Russians and and Britain. Uh, we helped a little bit. We were more concerned with what was happening in the South Pacific, right? Yeah. Um, but if the Nazis won and they took over America, then Eisenhower never became president. The Russians were defeated, and there wouldn't have been a change in the Pledge of Allegiance. So it's just weird to me. Like I think that that's a plot point. Like, or they hope, didn't want to get the comic book stabbed, or they didn't want to get the comic book stabbed. It, very a couple things because we were discussing this. I think even bef- you know before the show. Uh, Two points came to my head immediately, and I'm not a, a history buff, so I'm, one of them may be inaccurate. One, I believe Hitler, while definitely not by his actions, claimed to be Christian. No, he did, yeah. So that may have been put in there anyway due to his leadership. Or two, 
This is the the same thing as people who draw bullets with the casing still. They just weren't paying attention <laughs> and just got through. Well, I, I or think it could be a deeper cut, like what you're thinking. I think they're saying the Pledge of Allegiance without Hitler's knowledge. I yeah. think it's yeah, the it's underground outlawed. saying it. Oh, um, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, I won't even think of it. So, you're right. <laughs> um, I think it's one of those things that it's an alternate world and an alter- alternate timeline and just don't think too much about it. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe it I'm putting too much. Yeah, that, yeah. that could probably be it. But it could also be a plot point. It is Robert Vendetti. He's pretty good on that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, for them to actually – and it's in a line by itself on the page. So yeah. quite possibly it was either – you know, I, actually when I read it, I thought, well, good for them for not taking it out you know, based on current political environment. Right. So it was just interesting. Like, like I said, it, it stood out. So I think it wanted you to catch it. Yeah. And it's either, either because they didn't want to create a controversy, which I understand and respect. I yeah. get it. Or it's a plot point or they just missed it. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I just thought it was, it, it stood out to me. And I saw it and I was like, and well, if, they, if it turns out to be nothing, write it off as it's an alternate universe. Yeah, and, for sure. And things changed. It was, I, I know it's crazy, but out of everything that stood out to me mm-hmm. when I saw this page, I'm just like, huh. I'm curious now because I didn't catch the date of being John Kennedy's assassination yeah, date for either. the first page. Does it give the date for when they return? It just says 55 it just says 50 years, five years mm-hmm. later. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I wonder if it's on the same day. I don't know. But it would have been interesting if they'd put it on a date that something else had happened. Right. You know, like it, that was still a significant day in history, even though the world changed. John Kennedy wasn't there to be assassinated, but they they captured it and not only killed the freedom fighters, but they did it as a public spectacle and showed it on TV for an entire yeah. week. Brutal, right. brutal fashion. Yeah. I think they took doll man's head off. Yeah. They burned the human bomb to death. Yeah. Uh, they just incinerated him. What else can you do with him? Uh, yeah, well, and that was, I think that was part of the, mm-hmm. that was one of the things is like, you know, if we shot him, it was just going to explode the bullets. So mm-hmm. I had to figure, you know, fire doesn't technically touch anything. It's, um, it's kinetic energy is how his power works. Yeah. And then they just shot Black Condor. For yeah. I thought it was interesting that they left the Phantom Woman out, though. They included her in the last part of the book, but she wasn't in the first part. I wonder where she was yeah, at this point. said yeah. that she was dead. Did they? Was already. that one? Yeah, they had list off several characters. Was she one of them? Yeah. I okay. believe they... I'm sorry. I stepped away from the microphone for a second. That's but cool. I believe that they said that she was dead. There was two of them that they... When they were doing the Pledge of Allegiance that they were giving mm-hmm. a moment of silence for. Mm-hmm. And Phantom Lady, I believe, was one of them. That would make sense, yeah. Just add, are, are any of you guys reading Project Superpowers right now? I am not. And this reminds me a lot of that because they're they're going with these like Golden Age analog um, charlatan type of characters, and, mm-hmm. and I love I love that book. And I'm gonna like this book. Like I think I'm, I think it's made its way under my pool list. I'm yeah. I'm curious, uh, especially because it's an alternate universe. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily the the DC that that doesn't hook me. This is. This is interesting. I don't generally do sure. alternate universe, but this is one that it, it's intriguing to see an alternate reality when it's based on historical stuff. Yeah. I'd be honest, if uh, my buy pile was a little bit smaller, I'd jump on it. But yeah, it, well, I was definitely interested and, you know, maybe a trade paperback buy down the road. But yeah, I just I won't get on it now. But that's silly because I got too many books. Yeah. But it's still worth it. I still think it's very yeah, much absolutely. Worth, worth the read. The art is gorgeous mm-hmm. in this Love book. The art. Um, Eddie Barrows has this kind of Brian Hitch uh, meets Braithwaite feel. Um, you guys know if you, if you, it reminded me so much of the work that Braithwaite did on, I think it was Armor Hunters, the series from Valiant from a few years ago. Um, I read it probably a, about a year ago because I was trying to make myself get into Valiant. Um, cool stuff. It, it's it's I'm got use that a reference you guys wouldn't get, but. Braithwaite should fight, quit fighting the Greys, and then there wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> Please explain that. You're it's old. from Red Dead Redemption too. Oh, gotcha. Jerry's just not there yet. <laughs> yeah, I haven't made it. <laughs> too busy fishing. That's not a deep. That's like <laughs> right. a shallow cut. Yeah. It's so shallow we didn't know it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the old man, and I caught the you got the video game. Got the video game reference. The video game reference. Been shamed. We've we've all been shamed. I've just been playing the uh, old up on that. I, <laughs> I don't blame you. It's a great game. Anyways, been, go ahead, brother. Uh, yeah, sorry. no, that's 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 pretty much what I had to say. I, I think it's a great it, book. It's, it's beautifully drawn. The art is gorgeous in it. The story is very good. It's got the hooks you need for a first issue without being too much of a setup book. Yeah, it ends. Because this isn't the first Freedom Fighters book. There's been multiple yeah, there's, Freedom there's a history. Fighters. So it pretty much wipes away all the old Freedom Fighters 
uh, that we knew uh, in past books, and it gives us a new team based on those old totems. Very, yeah. And so, for, forgive my ignorance. This is Earth X. Now, Marvel has an Earth X too, right? Yes. What, was that it? the Alex Ross thing? Yes. Or did Alex Ross yeah. do the original Earth X for yeah. this? No. No, this is just like. Uh, Alex Ross. Has, Alex Ross. I know the did. Uncle Sam character from a lot of Alex Ross paintings. He's definitely did something involved in these characters. Okay. But it was different, obviously different than the Marvel yeah. Earth right. X yeah. stuff. And, and I don't think they've talked about that. Like, that hasn't been in continuity in a while. It hasn't this. been. I don't know what they're calling this Earth now because it, it, Caleb's right. That's where they came from. It was the Earth X world that this happened in. But with the new 52, and basically there's 52. Well, well, I know it was on. I know this was on. I was talking about the Marvel Earth X. Like they, it's kind of been irrelevant since. Oh yeah, it was a one. A it was just um, its own thing. But they actually, whenever they released Multiversity, and they had that map out of yeah. all of them, I, I'm pretty sure X was on that that map. Oh huh. yeah. Okay. Because I thought they renumbered them, but one through fifty two. They had some that were really weird. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there okay. was some that were like... It's been a long time yeah. since I looked at that map. Yeah. I'm not yeah. doubting Yeah, some you. were like shaded out. And stuff yeah. Like hmm. I wonder... Yeah. I may have to go back and check that out just to be sure. That's curious. Grant Morrison is the unintentional architect. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so we, you know, we give writers and pencilers a lot of credit, and they deserve it. Robert Venditti wrote a great book. You know, Eddie Barrows. I can't sing his praises enough. But you know, I want to give a shout out to the inker on this book. Uh, Eber Ferreria got got his money. Like they got it. They got their money's worth out of him. This book has so like it reminds me of Hitch so much because of all the cross hatching that he does. All the detail in this book. The architecture is brilliant. And I know the penciler does a lot of that. But this this is a great book if you want to know the work that a that an inker does the embellishment. Sometimes on this is, that sometimes it's up to the inker to not get not to oversaturate what right. the penciler did. And to me, this book had the right inking in it. It's a beautiful translation of those, those pencils. Yeah, Just for sure, phenomenal, for sure. absolutely. All right, so I, again, I think we're all agreed. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed this book. Check yeah, it out if you're looking for a book to pick up that just came out, and you're if alternate history stuff. Uh, and superheroes is your thing. This is it. Yeah, it's like seeing Nazis get blown up at the end of a book, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> go yeah. get the book. I'm sure it got stabbed by somebody. And Someone it, ate it. Somebody's like, gonna know why. It's uh, guys. twelve issues, right? I think so. Is it? Oh, so so it's a maxi series. Maxi series. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I don't know about you guys. I got the variant cover. That's it's got art by Ben Oliver, and it's got the uh, awesome. It's got a really great painting of. Um, I keep wanting, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. Keep wanting to say a different name, but I'm not going to say. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's got a beautiful painting of, of that, That's so awesome. uh, um, just check that out. Uh, real quick, though, I did find the uh, the map. There are some that have question marks on them. Uh, number ten, though, behind the ten has an X on it. Oh, so, okay. so it's Earth ten. Mm-hmm. They Very they renamed cool. it to a number, basically, yeah. instead of the Roman numeral. Yeah, so weird. Alternate universes are weird. I like them. I like them a lot. <laughs> I, I'd like to know what the hell's going on in Earth too. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right Sean, on. what did you read this week, brother? This week, my book of the week is Teen Titans number 25. Uh, we get the origin story of Crush, who uh, many are assuming based on her looks and kind of easy guess that she's the daughter of Lobo. But her and uh, Jin go out on a little like girl trip, basically. Uh, Crush wouldn't tell her what they're going after specifically, but she's like, I have to go do this. And she's like, I'll come with you. She's like, cool, we're stealing one of these bikes. They take off. <laughs> <laughs> and while they're traveling, they get, we get, we, uh, she starts talking, uh, Crush starts talking to Jen about her past and what her history is, is a fucked up version of Superman. Cause huh. it's, it flashes back to Burning Man Festival, where her two parents are high as fuck and see a crashing, uh, shooting star. That crashes, they want to go find it. While they're high on LSD and other such drugs, they find in a smoking crater, Crush, around with a sentient giant chain with blades at the at each end, like around her. And basically, these two drug addicts raise her, always on the run from dealers. That's and healthy. Kicked out. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. But she said they always treated her well. They never treated her different, you know, because she was, you know, obviously white skinned and. Permanent kiss, Cesarian. <laughs> you, you know, it makes me yeah. think of that um, the Lilo and Stitch meme where she's like, "Please, God, bring me, uh, you oh. know, my best friend." And then you see, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking a. 
But uh, yeah, so they they showed her growing up. Like they kept her obviously to being this. Honestly, they, they're junkies. I mean, they they had big drug problems, but they treated her well. They kept her by herself so for a while. She didn't think anything was different. She'd ask why she was like, well, "How come I don't look like mommy and daddy?" And they're like, "Well, you know, you're special." That's all they would tell her. As she got older. They kind of pointed at, like, they would point out that, like, Superman, like, special people like Superman. And there's a great drawing of this little crush with the chain around her wearing a princess dress. Going, I don't want to be a princess anymore. I want to be Superman. <laughs> <laughs> so even though she knows she's different, but her parents kind of encourage her. Like, you know, Superman, he, they're special too. You know, you could be like that. But uh, then she sees on the news Superman fighting Lobo. And, like, instant click. Like, that motherfucker looks like me. I don't look right. like Superman. <laughs> And being a teen, uh, at least a preteen by this point, she's pissed off at her parents. And it was just a big, uh, you know, like she said, you lied to me. You didn't, you know, you obviously, you know, because they're like, we don't, we didn't want to tell you about Lobo because we know he's a piece of shit and that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to hurt. They were worried like she would like start looking into him and looking up to him instead of Superman. Has anyone told DC that Lobo's a piece of shit? <laughs> <laughs> he's just not a good person. He's but, really not. <laughs> but he's a fun, good, good <laughs> He's person. a great character. Uh, and then she runs off on, out on her own. And like I said, her parents kept her always very secluded, at least a hoodie up or something covering her mm. because they knew she looked like Lobo. And some rednecks get a, uh, see her and start like, hey, that's, that looks like that Lobo asshole, or whatever. And they're like trying to beat the shit out of her. And, and she proceeds to beat the shit out of them <laughs> very easily. Uh, running back home after that incident, she sees their little uh, trailer is on fire. Gets in there, and her parents are both shot in the head, and the house is burning. So that's basically where she went on the run after that on her own. Eventually, led to the Teen Titans. They, they, they didn't really cut into that. Now it's cutting to today, where she wants her chain because she knows her parents are gone, and she has a feeling she knows who has the city. I'm going blank. I'll find it here and say the, the chain has a name, but I can't, oh, Obelus. I think it's O B E L U S. Obelus. Obel, not Obelisk. Just oh. Obelus. Something, something like that. Obelus. And then the she, uh, she's been tracking the uh, specific gamma radiation. Like Robin had noted a few times that it had this certain reading that kind of told her that it was the chance that so she's been tracking it down for a while. And she finally had her chance to go. And who they find, it gave me immediate Gary Oldman and true romance vibe. Oh, my <laughs> like this dude is a dreadlocked drug dealer mm-hmm. who broke down the chain and and like is commanding it. And he also reveals that he's the one who tracked down her parents for their debt, shot them, and burned the house. So he's got control of the chain, though, because he, he said he broke down his will and made it his own. He won't even call it by his name. It's just it. Hmm. You know, so we get a we get a fight with uh, Crush. Ezekiel is the guy's name. Sorry. Uh, there's a battle with them. Just talking about how, you know, you're a piece of shit just like this. And, you know, your parents were junkies. They raised you. You're nothing like that. But And he's sending the chain after Crush. They battle for a little bit. And yeah, she gets back to, though, she gets managed to get, break kind of the control of the chain and become <coughs> gonna kill him. Jin convinces him not to. And they had, they've had, throughout the same, it's a really bonding story about the, the shit Jin has seen in the millenniums that she's lived. And that's a whole other story, which we still haven't gotten her backstory. Hmm. And basically, you get a lot, you, you learn a lot more about Crush and why, kind of see why she's got these anger issues and why she just likes to use her rage because that's all she'd ever uh, express herself as when, as soon as she lost her parents. So, really good, like, origin story into Crush, which, you know, at first could have just been brushed off as the bruiser, the Lobo type, who, I mean, Lobo, what's his background? I killed my planet, I'm a badass with a bike. So, I think it gave a lot more depth to who could have been a shallow character. Mm-hmm. Wait, so are the Lobos the Skywalkers of the DC world? Well, and here's the thing, though, too, because as far as we know, <laughs> she's assuming, like, they kind of imply it without saying, it, like, obviously, since he's the last, he has to be the dad. Mm-hmm. But is he? I would say the fact that she was found on the planet the same as Superman leaves That's it wide open. I'm thinking, like, he may not be the dad. She may have got off planet before he killed him. Yeah. yeah. Or there was already somebody off planet. There's a time warp or yeah. something. Something. So it's interesting. Let's do the time warp. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. Look, look, I got one more thing to say, and then we'll jump to the left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There is also a quick backup story explaining how Roundhouse survived getting launched into the atmosphere and was oh, missing nice. for six weeks. It was It's a fun little story that gives a little bit into him as well. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give too much into that because like the big selling point is Crush's origin, mm-hmm. but this is a really good backup story as well. That's it's a really, really cool good book. Because I think everybody just assumed, like you said, that she was going to be Lobo's daughter. Yeah, and I think that's even what they kind of... bruiser. That's how she's been up until yeah. now. But showing like the, the you know, what, what if meth heads found Superman? <laughs> 
kind of thing. But like, not horrible like meth heads, but still yeah. leading a, a, a different life. So, so I thought that book's going to get stabbed because it portrayed rednecks as bad guys. So uh, <laughs> now that they've had what uh, five, Am six issues no. of, of this, how, how are you liking this run? Oh, uh, there's yeah. twenty five issues. In there. Well, I know since that, they, the but new since they since oh, they started the new, new team, team. And everything. oh, I'm yeah. digging it a lot yeah. more than the initial launch mm-hmm. and then all the other previous fail launches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This team's got a good dynamic. It's made me actually tolerate Damian Wayne, mm-hmm. even though he's still an asshole, which is what supposed, which is what he's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, I'm digging the shit out of this book. I think if uh, you're interested in Teen Titans, like you could jump on, you, even if you can't go all the way back to the beginning of it, jump on when this new team formed, or even here recently, you can. I think you could jump in pretty easily. Nice. By episode 102, cool. I'm gonna have you in love with Damian Wayne. It's gonna happen. <laughs> Never. It's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so. For the second week in a row, I'm going to talk about the week, the book that was my uh, uh, getting ahead of ourselves the previous week. Nice. We're going to talk about Darth Vader number 25, uh, Marvel Comics. Uh, the Charles Soule wrote it. Uh, GSB Cam and Coley. <laughs> Good job. Did the pencils. Cam Smith did the inks. David Curiel, Dono Sanchez Almara, and Eric Arcianega on colors a lot of people worked on this book it was uh this is the 25th issue the final issue of this volume of darth vader mm-hmm. i know charles soul gets a lot of shit but this darth vader runs been one of the best uh, star wars books and guys this book potentially changes the star wars mythology to give you some background on it it takes place between revenge of the sith and before the events of rogue one it's Darth Vader building his castle that we see in Rogue One. He just completed that in the last issue. Well, this castle is being built because of the immense dark powers on Mustafar. He built it here to, because he wanted to be able to channel those powers. Mm-hmm. But when he channels these powers, he finds out he's able to open a gateway to... Really? So, so he's kind of a necromancer now. What? It Just in this one, yeah. one thing. So what's... Darth Vader want more than anything else at this point. Padme. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Padme. Yeah, yeah. And he wants his wife. So so he's going to go through this portal and he's going to get Padme back. So he goes through the portal. As he walks through the portal, his suit of armor falls backwards and his essence continues to walk forward into this portal. So kind of an astral progression projection kind of thing? Yeah, so you don't know if it's a force vision or what, but... It's very well portrayed. At first, I thought it was oversimplistic, but the more I went back, and I've read this book three times, guys. Wow. As he goes back through it, his body becomes just this red energy of dark side force power, and it's just kind of shown as red lines on a black background. And the really cool thing they did is where he's missing limbs are just shown as white. So, because the force doesn't mm-hmm. run through those mechanical places. This is where it gets interesting because it replays his entire life, all the key points of his entire life, starting with his conception. So, what's the thing we know about Anakin's conception is that he's shrouded in mystery. Yeah, he's supposed to be space Jesus. Like, he was, he was created by, by the force to be the chosen one. No. Really? The emperor created him. It so shows Shmi standing there and the emperor is waving his hands around her belly and the dark side force power is swirling within her stomach. The emperor is his baby. Uh, the emperor Smee's baby daddy. He never, they never had sex. He used the force, they, the dark side to create Anakin. Yeah, they talk about it in the prequels that, um, uh, Palpatine had actually mentioned, uh, his master without mentioning, you know, that it was his master that he could manipulate the force to create life. Right, And it's very heavily suggested in Revenge of the Sith, like Jerry's saying during that scene, that maybe Palpatine did mm-hmm. create Anakin. George Lucas at different times has said that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. They didn't elaborate it on in the movies. It is now, if if this is, granted it's a dark side vision, it could be manipulating things. But according to this, the Emperor used the dark side of the force to create Anakin within Shmi. So that would change everything in the mythos. No longer was he the chosen one. No longer did he destroy the Sith. The Sith could still be out there and still be going because that wasn't his thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did destroy the Sith, but we don't know that they still don't exist in some other 
form. Oh, right? yeah. We didn't know anything about Snoke either. And he's right. Yeah. So from that standpoint, it really changes things. Right. So then it goes on and um, he goes to the, it, it shows different scenes, shows him fighting all everybody that was on the council, the Jedi council, which, of course, didn't happen. So some things are obviously how he's projecting himself. Right. Well, then it comes to uh, two people standing there and he says, which one's my father? Well, it's Obi-Wan and it's the emperor. They do battle. The Emperor kills Obi-Wan, and then Vader kills the Emperor, which, of course, is a premonition of him killing the Emperor later. Mm -hmm. So then he comes to Padme, and she says, are you an angel? She basically says the same lines that he said to her when he first first met, are you an angel? I hear they're the most beautiful people in the world, or in the galaxy. And he says, come with me. I I can fix all of this. I can make this better. Come back with me. And he looks like Anakin at this point. He doesn't look like Vader. He doesn't even look like the red ball of energy. He looks like Anakin. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes, wait, you're not Anakin. Anakin's dead. So she turns her back on him again and jumps off the edge of this podium that she's on and kills herself. And of course, yeah, he's screaming, no, not again. And realizing that She turned her back on him again because she could still see the negative energy, the dark side energy. So you see the conflict. His body changes from red to blue, back to red again, to blue one more time, and then he gets sucked back in. So all of the conflict that Luke senses in him all goes back to Padme and him trying to restore being good Mm -hmm. because he knows if he can get that back, he still has this gateway. He can still go back through it and pull her back. But he's never able to do that. So Wow. Yeah, the mythology, they they changed it so much with this and what it means for the future of Star Wars. They even use lines from The Last Jedi, kill your past if you have to. Let the past go, kill it if you have to. He he actually says that at one point. That's what I love about Star Wars. Because it is it it, it leaves itself open for to 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 evolve, it, to be ever changing. Yeah, I mean, and it's one of those things that I mean, even Yoda said it in Revenge of the Sith. It's a prophecy that we could have misread. So if you take... We know that Star Wars is moving away from the Skywalkers Mm -hmm. after this trilogy. Because there's not... I mean, maybe Kylo Ren redeems himself and still is alive. I really doubt it. Um, I don't think he's going to die, but I don't think he's going to redeem himself. But they're moving away from the Skywalkers. There aren't going to be any left. So they have to expand this universe beyond that. Yeah. You can't have everything tied up in this one family if you want this galaxy-wide opportunity to bring in other heroes and make them. People have been saying since the beginning that Ray's really the chosen one. I just want a Kit Fisto adventure. You just want fisted. Uh, no, <laughs> go go watch uh, Clone Wars. They they have yeah, there's like a lot at of least yeah, no, yeah. one or two episodes of that is. Absolutely him centric. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to digest the whole thing. Like like you said, of course it could be altered visions. I don't know if I like the idea of the Emperor creating him because I think I liked it a little bit better. And like I said, it may just be me. Obviously just me, but you know what I mean? Like I think I liked that the story of better of someone who could have been born either way, being you know, neutral birth and could have gone either way just as powerful. With, now with evil origin already, it kind of like well, it's you could, like that's how I'm trying. I've been trying ever since you said that. I've been trying to kind of wrap my head into it. And like, so yes, you still he born of evil. He could have been good. I see that story, but I think I just liked the neutral birth, and it could have gone either way. I think I like that better. So, but I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad revelation, but I'm not, I'm not crazy about it. Um, I like it in in one sense. I, I, I'm very kind of neutral on this, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, because I like it in one sense that it's wiped away the chosen one thing. Right. I agree with you that yeah, was, was he created an evil or was he created by the dark side of the force? Yes, that doesn't inherently make him evil. He still had the opportunity to make decisions along his way. Do you think it lessens the tragedy of his fall? No, I don't. Because no, I, I don't know, that's kind of what it's every person, me a bit, maybe, every but. person in Anakin's life manipulated him. Every person that was supposed yeah. to take care of him, every person that was supposed to protect him, every person that was supposed to be a figure in his life 
ended up using and manipulating him for their own good. Right. And when when Obi Wan came to him in Revenge of the Sith and said they want you to spy on the Emperor, that was the final straw because it was the last person that hadn't manipulated him was now asking him to do something that that he hmm. felt wrong doing. That that and then he shows up and Mace Windu is going to break the Jedi code and kill the Emperor. Right. It, had people acted different, had Qui Gon not died, Anakin probably wouldn't have turned. So um, I really feel like it's it's still very a, tra- a tragic story. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's not still, but it, I, feel, I don't know. It kind of feels less than if he has a dark origin. I don't, and that's just it, my interpretation. It almost makes it more tragic because of the fact that here's a guy that wasn't the chosen one that they had put all of that pressure on his whole life, that he is the chosen one. It almost adds a little bit to the tragedy. I just, I just want to add that Craig is opining about about this wearing a shirt that says the dark side. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to like, point out that Craig is taking a neutral side with this, so he is a great Jedi. Great Jedi. They don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll move Lance on. Rants. No, we're good. But, yeah, um, yeah I... It's an easy read. There's not a lot of uh, uh, words in it. It's a lot of pictures. It's um, it, which is one of the reasons I, I went back and I've looked and studied every panel in this yeah. because once I realized that happened, it's like, wait, did I miss anything else? And obviously, the battle between the two fathers is a big thing. One was mm-hmm. his figurative father. One potentially his literal father. Again, it's a dark side vision. None of this may have happened. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's definitely scenes in it that didn't happen. He never fought the entire Jedi Council, Mm -hmm. literally. He fought them figuratively his Mm -hmm. whole life. So a lot of this is still up for interpretation. Very cool. Uh, Yeah, I thought it was awesome whenever you were telling me about it on the way, on the trip that we just took. But yeah, yeah, um, I I honestly like that uh, interpretation. I I think, you know, I I kind of, uh, going back and watching the prequels again, in the way that that Palpatine was kind of talking to him and talking about the dark ways of the Force, and it, like, I kind of had this feeling of like, yes, the Force created him, but maybe there was you know more to it, and that's it's pretty pretty awesome to have that validated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's still created by the Force. It oh, was yeah. just the Force being manipulated by somebody to do it <laughs> instead of the Force actually doing it. Yeah, so it it works in mysterious ways, I think. Yeah. Um. So the uh, the I boo. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I read books this week. Um. I actually had there was like what four things that ended. Uh, extermination ended, right? Yep. Number five. Came uh, out. Infinity Wars ended. Uh, which I haven't got to read yet. Uh, Spider Geddon ended, and um, Old Man Hawkeye ended. And I was gonna, I was debating on if I wanted to do Spider Geddon or Old Man Hawkeye, but I figured next week I'll talk about Spider Geddon since there's not a lot coming out, and then hopefully Craig had read it by then, so we can cross talk with it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, so in Old Man Hawkeye, the whole premise of the story has been uh, Clint got betrayed. Whenever all the villains took over, he got betrayed by the Thunderbolts, and pretty much lost everything. Uh, so the whole story has been a revenge story. Of him going through and killing all of the Thunderbolts that had, had killed him. the Or had betrayed him. Um, the last one that he had to get to uh, was actually up in Canada. And it was, uh, was it uh, Baron Zemo? And in the last issue, um, you actually find out that Zemo's had a, uh, a laboratory where he's been trying to perfect the super soldier serum. And they had finally gotten it. He had, you know, had all these uh, scientists held hostage, making them work for him. And they had perfected the serum. And Clint is actually with, um, what was the uh, female Haw- Hawkeye? Uh, Kate? Kate. Kate. Kate Bishop. Yep. Uh, she's, she's been with him. Like, he had to go to her for help. So she's been part of this road trip, too. Um, so Clint gets captured. She's sneaking in. Um, you end up finding out that Zemo is like in a wheelchair and like has a feeding tube and all this shit. And Clint doesn't give a shit. He (laughs) killed some of the most important people in his life and he ends up putting him out of his misery. Um, Meanwhile, you have bullseye that's been tracking him this whole time. Um, He finally ends up getting there just as 
this whole place is going down uh, because fucking um, I'm trying to think it's it's not Quake Avalanche mm-hmm. uh, it was at the base and you know and if you've read Old Man uh, Logan like that story you know that Clint is blind they talked about it I was going to ask if they talk the... about it at the beginning of this series because I think he's got like cataracts or something well fucking Avalanche gets the upper hand on him and just sticks his hands on his face and fucking vibrates and makes him go blind wow yeah so he ends up getting the upper hand on avalanche and then with the help of kate bishop directing him where to fire and everything they make it out alive and then there's bullseye and he basically they have the whole standoff where bullseye's got kate bishop and he's gonna like cut her throat and hawkeye's standing there with one arrow you know and um Kate does a, a quick move and gets out of the way and he shoots bullseye through the like right through the uh, cyborg guy because he had like cybernetics and stuff. Um, the, because of course, so they did. turned him into dead shot. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the technology that they used mm-hmm. was uh, Deathlock. Okay, technology. Um, the series was was really good. I really love the art in it. Um, the uh, they had a basically after credit scene so like the very end of the book was kate dropping him off at wolverine's doorstep which picks up with old man logan i was going to ask that so mm-hmm. i knew that this was kind of derived from that but mm-hmm. is it is it that same universe or? absolutely same okay universe. yep uh they they showed a lot of stuff uh like the venom symbiote um in in old man logan how it's on the t-rex they showed how it got on yeah. there because it started mm-hmm. off on like multiple man uh, because they started cloning themselves and then there was all these like venom symbiotes with multiple man. That's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, God damn it, they, uh, <laughs> they ended up going through like the desert and there was like a savage land part of it and it like a T-Rex ate it and then it <laughs> got covered in that. So, um, so yeah, okay. they, they leave off with that. They have a letter talking about how they're going to be picking it back up on old man quill, which I'm excited about cause this was fucking awesome. Um, and then the last page that they have is uh, Clint, and it looks like he's walking into a monastery, you know, like in the Himalayas or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are all these like monks around, and he walks up to somebody and he's like, you know, um, can you help me? I heard that you, you might be able to help me. And then he calls this person Stick, and he's like, you don't have to call me that. Just call me Matt. You know who I am. And it shows Whoa. an aged huh. Matt huh. Murdock, an old man Matt R- Murdock. And I was like... Yes. So, I mean, hypothetically, we could get an old man daredevil. Book. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And I, I am so here for it. Um, I mean, if if they just keep letting this same team develop this universe, I'll pick up every title. Yeah. It's It's been really good stuff. And and I really like that where you get like the second or third issue in and you you see the fall of like this hero and stuff and how, you know, they've they've become this old grizzled person um, that they are. Nice. Yeah. And. It was it was a really good story. I liked it from beginning to end. So, is anybody else reading? Did anybody else read this? I did not. I bought it mm-hmm. with the intention of reading it, but my reading load was so high when it started coming out that mm-hmm. I just ended up having to skip it. Yeah, I bought the first one and ended up not following through with it. But I think mm-hmm. I'm going to end up picking it up and trade because it yeah. sounds sounds awesome. It was, like I'm kind of sad I missed this. It was really good. They they introduced they showed you what a lot of other characters were doing. Uh, you got to see a lot more of the world. Yeah. And everything like that. Um, So so when Old Man Logan came out, that was in the Wolverine book, if I'm not mistaken. It was a storyline in the old Wolverine Mm -hmm. book. When that happened, I was under the impression, it's been a minute since I read it, but that Hawkeye and and Logan were the only two left. I mean, of course, Maestro was because he was the bad guy, but I mean, it was... Well, it technically wasn't Maestro, like... It was, but it wasn't like it was. It was a different take on him. Yeah, yeah. It was a different, different maestro from the end. But yeah, yeah it was. It was maestro. Well, yeah, but yeah. I think you're right, though. I think it, it was maybe originally implied, implied. But you know, you you, you wouldn't mean, necessarily yeah. know you, that they're not you, out there. You absolutely know that most of the X Men are dead. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Cause Logan killed them. Yeah, because yeah. Wolverine's a piece of shit. <laughs> you know that um, <laughs> they uh, he was created with dark side energy. <laughs> I was trying to remember who all they showed die in this book. I want to say it was. Um, Falcon um, and uh, Black Widow for sure, but I can't remember who else was was in that scene. But that was his main thing was avenging Black Widow, uh, Natasha, and everything. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then I mean, with them showing Matt 
And Kate yeah. Bishop actually had a sanctuary where she was like trying to to keep um, all these women safe and everything like that. And so there, there could easily. I don't think Kate be... Bishop, the character, was in existence when they made Old Man Logan. I don't think she first, first appearance was a Young Avengers book, I believe. So yeah, I don't. I don't it was, know that it she was, was similar uh, to that time. I but think Young Avengers came out before Old Man Logan. I have, I'd have to look at the yeah. dates. I'm not sure, it but certainly wouldn't have been a character that they would have that they would have put into Old Man Logan. Yeah. Saying yeah, yeah, and. So yeah, uh, like I said, I'm on board. I am ready for Old Man Quill, which I think actually comes out next month. Jerry is the one person I've heard say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they sold me with this series. Yes. Is it the same team doing Old Man? Uh, Quill? I believe so because they in the back of their letters they actually mentioned um, we'll see you uh, you know in, in Old Man Quill. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean it just kind of yeah. has it on the back of here. So hmm. I, I wonder if they are. Team. I bet it's the same team. They wouldn't have Probably. said that. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, that's the same editorial team. Because a lot of times, a lot of times, your editors oh, uh, run the yeah, run the back. Written of the by uh, Old Man Hawkeye, scribe Ethan Sachs, yeah. with art by Robert Gill. Okay. Yeah. So um, at least same writer. Yeah, uh, Ethan Sachs. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, the artists will be different for it. Uh, you know, we actually didn't talk about the. What I was, I was Marvel actually did. about yeah. to say a big shout out to Marvel for what they did with all their books being. Uh, what do you want to call them? It's like not blank cover because there's, there's no title. It's just the drawings, wraparounds, and a very nice drawing of Stan Lee in the very beginning. I mean, I'd give them a big shout out if they hadn't fucked it up. Huh? Well, <laughs> this one was the only oh. one that they did. Because this is, they were, so were they all originally supposed to have Stan Soapbox? We in don't back? know if that one's wrong or if all the rest yeah. of the lines. Because yeah. I know the rest oh. of them have it on the inside. Yep. Yeah. So. And like the soapboxes are supposed to be different. I, it, it was a. I like the drawing. It was a cool yeah. shot. <laughs> they gave it a try. It was a cool yeah. memorial. And then they have a sketch of uh, Stan on the uh, inside the front cover. Yeah, which makes me think that that one, the Spider Yen, is actually wrong. Probably. Because if the Stan Lee's on the inside, the soapbox should be on the inside. Yeah. But still, it's uh, it was a nice sentiment, and I don't care that it was a week before Christmas. <laughs> People aren't going to be crying over. Oh it, no! So. It's it that they needed to do it now. It's yeah. when it happened. Yeah. So. All right, so well, you read? All right, so my book of the week this week is Aquaman number 43. Uh, so I picked this book. I haven't been reading Aquaman. It's not a book that I've ever really cared about before. Um, but I picked this book for two reasons. Number one, the film came out this week, and I thought mm -hmm. it's a good time to talk about Aquaman. It's, you know, everybody's talking about it. The other reason is because this is the first issue that is written by a, a writer who I absolutely love. I think she does a great job with everything that she does. Uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick with uh, Robson Roca on pencils, Daniel Henriquez as the inker, Sonny Cho as a colorist, and Clayton Cowles, um, you know, is doing everything that gets letters these days. So that dude's just all over the place. Um, this was a fun book. So I say it was a fun book. I, I'm not in love with this book. Uh, it's not a, like I'm in love with the art. Um, so beautiful. Robson Roca is amazing. If you haven't seen his art, you need to go check it out because uh, the last thing I remember seeing him on is he did some Green Lantern stuff during Rebirth. Uh, I'm not sure what his run was on that. I know he's done. Um, I think he did the Green Lanterns book. Uh, he did a lot of stuff in the New Fifty Two. He kind of leveled up at this book though. This book is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is another book that the Inker earned their pay. Uh, it's a it's a very it's not photorealistic, but it's just very detailed. Honestly, it, you know what it reminds me of, Sean? It reminds me of Sword Daughter. Yeah, it's oh, got okay. a very it's got a very Sword Daughter feel um, from that book. If you're if you at home are reading that book, it gives you an idea of what to expect. So, this book is, I feel like I've read it before, and that's my big problem with it. If I have a problem, it is a very well written version of something I've read before. So. In this book, it's, it, it opens up on a beach, and there is a character kind of collecting flowers, um, doing some type of ritual thing. There's a dead rabbit involved. Uh, and then it cuts to a window scene, and Aquaman is looking out the door, and he's like, you know, she's going to catch her death out there. The storm's raging. It's not a safe place to be. And what you found out is Aquaman, um, and, and again, I have not been reading this title. I do not know what happened in the last issue, if this is why. He is apparently washed up on this island, has amnesia, doesn't remember who he is. Um, doesn't I think know it's his... following up to the uh, the drowned earth. Possibly. Because he fought them, and I, I think maybe there's something there with his memory loss. Yeah. So. 
and being returned. Does to he Earth. now look like Jason Momoa? He doesn't. Well, he looks like a he looks like an Aryan version of Jason say, Momoa. With that, I'm assuming variant cover or whatever that you have on there, that's going to be yeah. very misleading for someone to grab it off the shelf. Well, this is yeah, this is a variant cover too that's meant to make him look like that. But inside, he, he's a very uh, kind of looks like he's the lost member of Sons of Anarchy. You know, he's got a full blonde <laughs> beard, long blonde hair. He's wearing he's wearing green pants. He's got the Aquaman symbol on his belt, but uh, you know, just a leather jacket. And what he's doing is he's helping out this older couple who has kind of adopted him. Like they're, he washed up on the beach. He doesn't know who he is. They kind of took him in, and they're kind of taking care of him. And he's helping out. Um, this island, the local economy, subsists of fishing, and the fishing is bad. The sea is angry. Uh, that Something is wrong. The fish are washing up dead. Their nets are empty. They're starving. They're having to eat potato soup, which I personally love potato soup. I don't understand the problem. I love potatoes. They're <laughs> excellent. I, this old dude is just being grumpy for no reason. He's an asshole. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> that's my, guy, that's my deep that page there. That's just... that's my deep love of, of potato soup. Um, there is a character in this book though that is introduced, and her name is Callie, and she is kind of the red woman. She's walking on the beach. She's the one that you see at the first. That's you know collecting stones. There's a dead rabbit involved, um, and our, our our boy is kind of smitten with her. He you know she's gorgeous. Uh, this book kind of sets up a mythology, in a sense. It. Uh, Callie. So essentially, this island is all full of an island of castaways, and and you find that out through the book. All of these characters at one point in their lives have washed up on this island. They've been they've been kidnapped by the sea, quote to speak, and and cast away. They've angered the sea. They're all being punished, including Callie. Except Callie showed up as an infant with her mother, um, their mother who didn't try to have a repentive attitude towards the sea. wasn't trying like curse the sea. How dare the sea throw her out and take her away from her people? And so they kind of abandoned her. Like, they did the whole, like, villager, like, cast out the witch thing. And they sent her off to live on her own little rocky island. But they kept her baby, which is kind of a dick move, right? Like, you don't just keep somebody's baby. Uh, weird island people. Um, so uh, <laughs> so they've raised this child. And what they, they come to decide is um, this may be this castaway woman uh, has cast a curse and has, has changed the sea against them. And that's why they're doing this. So they ask Arthur, who they're calling Adams or Ad- Adam or something. Yeah, like Adonis that. or just something, some A name. Like they, they know it's an A name because of the um, A on his belt. Yeah, but they're they're calling him all this kind of things, and they're, they're like, "All right, you got to get Callie back to her mom and really solve this problem." Again, Callie has no understanding of what's going on. Um, she's just the type of girl who likes to walk on the beach during monsoons uh, and and get threatened to get washed out. Um, which <laughs> As is what, you do. Which is what happens at the end of the book. <laughs> Arthur runs down to save her. And the sea kind of splits around them. Um, this series, this this arc, is called the Unspoken Water. And what you find out is the Unspoken Water. There's there's it, it, that's a literal term. There is something magical about this unspoken water. And so what they offer to Arthur um, is like if you do this, if you take if you take this this girl back to her mother, uh, we will let you drink of the Unspoken Water, and it will refresh your memories. He looks at it and he sees a picture. He sees a, an image of, of Mira. Uh, so it's there's something in there. And he's like, what, what what kind of witchcraft magic is this? And that's what leads him to go do it. It is a gorgeously drawn book. It is a beautifully written book. It's just not very original. I mean, how many stories are we going to get where Arthur watches washes up on a beach with no memory? Like that's I, I don't read a lot of Aquaman, but that's just kind of a trope I know. Like that's a repeated thing. Um, so I'm not particularly interested in. I, I want to finish this arc because, again, I think it's gorgeously written. It's a it's a really really well done version of something that we've had before. Um, it's not bad, not bad well, at all. Well, you know, there's certain tropes for certain uh, characters that every time a new writer gets them, they want to revisit right. those tropes. Um, I like the idea that he's still got the power over the sea, but he doesn't realize it. Yeah, it, and it's just an instinctual thing. The sea. That it's almost like Moses dividing the sea in mm-hmm. one scene, um, because he's no longer the king of Atlantis. He gave up that power. Mira, Mira's Mira's the, yeah. running Atlantis, and I haven't been running. I haven't been reading Aquaman for a minute either. But he gave it up because he was too divided between Earth and. Mm-hmm. and well, you know the ocean is on Earth, right? So. Between land and sea, <laughs> you can throw things at him if you want to. Violent things. <laughs> Earth also means dirt, douchebag. <laughs> there's there's dirt at the bottom of the sea. Well, and, and at the beginning of this issue, there's a beautiful line. Um, it says, "In the beginning, there was the ocean. The ocean was the source, the rule, and what we call land was the exception." Again, that's yeah. that's the first line. It's a beautifully written book. It yeah. just 
Uh, I'm going to stick around for the art. That, the art's what I'm here for. I will definitely get issue 44. Uh, I want to see what Kelly Sue does because I think I think this book is going places. It's a setup book and give it a chance to to develop into the story yeah. she's telling. It may be similar to something you think you've already read, but we don't know what the actual story no. is going to be. Yet, so. For sure. Um, so yeah. I liked it. I'm going to keep reading it. I've been off Aquaman since I want to say like issue five of this run. Yeah. Because they were telling another politics story in it, which I don't care about politics and comics. That's part of it. What I didn't care is it was one more time Atlantis was fighting with the land. Right. And it was What do over. they think this is, Namor? Yeah, right. So it, <laughs> yeah. it became a, it, that same trope that you see in every Aquaman book. So I got off of it. I've heard it's been amazing. Uh, with her coming on, I, I jumped all over it. Yeah. It, it's 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 gorgeous it is gorgeous. It, that's just all i can say i can't say that enough there, there's pages in that book that i would love to have oh yeah but we don't need another fish out of water story <laughs> <laughs> so i think this is the fish going back in which i hate Get the fuck out of here no, no i hate Give it, it up. so much <laughs> <Give> um <laughs> i think this is the fish going back into the water yes and it, it's gonna if it moves fast then i'm going to be pleased it's only a three store a three issue story arc so it's going to right this is just her saying okay we don't need to know about what happened before because this is going to be Arthur's story from this point on. It's like I said, it's got a very, it's got a, it's it's myth- mythological. Like the, that's what it I when very I, much it when felt I, very Greek to me. Right when, when I'm reading it, it, I'm like Wonder Woman's going to walk around the corner mm-hmm. in this place anytime. It, it, it felt very Greek or Roman to me. It was very much that mythology type story. Aquaman's always been one of those books that I always hears really good, but I've never had the room on my pull list for it. Yeah, um, it's it's one that I've always he, always wanted. Dan He's a Abner. character that you have to want to read because ultimately, until Jeff Johns had him in New Fifty Two, mm-hmm. no one really had a set power set for right. Aquaman. It was kind of all over the board depending on who was writing him. All of a sudden, with Jeff Johns, we found out. Oh wait, he's got super strength. He's got. He just has to be near the ocean once in a while. But overall, he's he's Superman of the sea. Is yeah, kind of what we found out. So, Which was everything. Uh, right. Wonder Woman was Superman of women. Right. Um, <laughs> you know. But I mean, really, it came down to that he was about as strong as Superman. Right. I mean, he <laughs> literally had Superman's strength in that book when Jeff Johns was writing him. Did, did, did Superman have dolphin friends? No. Right. Superman's better. <laughs> does that does that make Batman the uh, Superman without powers? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like every DC character, we're just going to break him down as a different this version. <laughs> Batman <laughs> is a Superman of man. <laughs> <laughs> He's got super richness. Hey, can you go back, like, post-editing and... Um, like bleep out every time you say dead rabbits because I don't want us to get shut down, Caleb. No, I, I, yeah, if they boy. sue us and we get that name recognition, that's dead right. rabbits, dead rabbits, oh, dead no. rabbits. God, I want that book. But uh, yeah, that's my. So if you if you went and watched Aquaman, or if you took a family member to go watch Aquaman, and they're like, "Oh, cool," and you want to bring them to a comic, just let them know, hey, like this this isn't the Aquaman from the film. It, it, it ties into it. Like you're going to know the character, but it's a really beautiful book. Um, it is beautiful, it, it, and it's beautifully written. And it, you know, if I hadn't had the history and have knew the tropes like have have knew the big points of aquaman i probably wouldn't have been nearly as meh about what i was reading because it's the best version of that that i've read just to be honest um but it's still it's still oh like we're doing this again okay we're we're retreading a tire it's kind of like when you when you find iron man picking up a drink exactly i've seen it before or batman loses his business or we've seen it before we don't have to see it again but you know, then when they change characters, people whine about diversity. So it's what do you, you know, you either tell the yeah. same stories again or you change them and people whine about that. So but that's my uh, that's my book of the week. Were there any like honorable mentions this week? Anything else that deserves? I'm going to be honest. I only read like four books this week because of everything going on. So uh, Middle West mm-hmm. number two was fantastic. Um, it came out. I think it did come out last week, but just kind of back it up, Jerry. I, I went and bought the Miles Morales. And I read it this week. Yeah, that was a fucking really yeah. good book. I read it. Yeah. I read it this week. It was fun. Uh, third issue of Sparrowhawk came out. Yeah, I haven't uh, read it. Yet, I was really so. hard pressed not to talk about that today, but uh, it's there's only two issues left. I'm gonna be sad whenever it's over. I really like. So it. I haven't read. Uh, <laughs> I've read two books this week. I have read uh, Freedom, Freedom Fighters, Fighters number yes. one and Aquaman forty three because wedding. Yeah, well, we had the wedding thing. I've been out of town. Um, also, 
not a super huge pull from last week, and next week has almost no comics coming out. I yeah. think across the board, there are in, in all of everything. 11. I counted them. There's 11 books coming out. Yeah, yeah. so uh, what, what I did is... One, one I, of them is X-Force. One of them is, is X-Force. Hyper. And one of them is Superior Spider-Man. What I did is I split my pull list this week. I said, hey, take half of these, save them next week. I'll double up next week. Um, I have a big box of like OGNs and mm-hmm. graphic novels and stuff beside my chair in my office that I've bought and I haven't tried to read yet. So my goal over this Christmas break is to get as many of them read as possible. And I'm doing great. I've read like seven so far. Like I've been reading a shit ton. It's just not new stuff. Um, if you want to come on my Instagram page or my Twitter page and see what I'm reading, I always let people vote on what I read next. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can Glad you finally listened to Jerry and I and read Peter Pan's. I did, but you didn't, you won that poll. I read it for you, not Jerry. <laughs> I read it for you, Craig. Uh, what, what's What's been your favorite so far? Oh, that uh, that Eternals was really good. The Eternals is good. It was, but it's not 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 top of my list. Yeah, um, Crimson. You know, <laughs> Scout. You know, Neil Gaiman just unretweeted you. He did retweet <laughs> me the other day, but, but um, he just unretweeted you. Well, so he no, just said it wasn't your favorite. Well, then that's fine. Um, <laughs> I don't like cosmic stuff, and yeah. so again, it's it's. You know, I just said about Kelsey Duconic. This is the best version of something that I've read that I don't know that I need to read again. Right. Um, that was, yeah, it was cosmic stuff. It's Jack Kirby-esque. It's fourth world, the Marvel version that yeah. he did better than fourth world. Um, yeah. But it's not something I really just need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably Scalped. If I had to name one, I think Scalped is still my favorite yeah. thing that I've read. Yeah. What, Jason Aaron. What, what did you think of Crimson? Loved it. Loved it. It was absolutely the 1998 goth vampire loving corn listening uh, vampire, the masquerade playing thing that I needed at that age that I didn't get till I was 30. Nice. It's phenomenal. I was about to finally sit down and read my set of that, and then Craig bought me the third volume of my <laughs> uh, book series I've been reading. So I'm on that. So. He's good like that. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to get the Crimson eventually. Though. But that, that's what I've been doing. So, yeah, follow that. Keep up keep up with it. Some great books. Um, we are not doing a getting ahead of ourselves this week because, again, there's only like 11 books come out. But uh, I think we're all agreed. Go check out Superior Spider-Man. Check out X-Force. I think those are the two books. And we got together and just be. Because there's not as much stuff coming out next week, I think we decided to roundtable Middle West number two. Yeah. Did we not? Is that, that what we're going to do? Yeah. So it's a book that came out last week that you can catch up with. Um, or did, It's phenomenal. It, like, I loved issue one. And so I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm going to enjoy roundtabling it with you guys and give you guys a week at, a, at home, a week to go grab it, maybe get through the holidays, read it, and read it with us. Check it out. So um, other than that, do we have any other stuff we need to bring up? Are we ready to bring this thing home? I think that's we're it. good. All right, let's do this. Well, hey, out there in Radio World, we really hope that you have enjoyed what you've heard. As always, we try to put on the best show possible for you guys. We love doing it. Come join us on our Facebook page. We have a group there. It's set up. We're always sharing news. We're always sharing articles. We're chatting. We're creating a community. It's just a lot of fun. It's what we want to do. We're also sharing stuff on Instagram and Twitter all the time. We're at SFG Podcast. If you have any concerns, you have any questions, you have any comments, and you don't want to drop it on social media for everybody else to see, Shoot us an email. We're southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. If nothing else, go forth and love some comics. Yeah.